Yeah, yeah, perfect, yeah. Ellie. So what, what we'll do is just wait. We'll just wait about two minutes because there's loads of people coming in. Uh, there's going to be a big delay. So we'll just leave everything on the screen for now. We'll just wait a couple minutes. Just let everyone in. Absolutely. And Shivam, I'm really excited for this virtual work experience today. I mean, we've got over 600 people coming to join us. Um, we've got lots to talk about, lots of interaction. Um, so it should be a really nice session today. Um, for everyone who is currently joining, one thing you can do just while you're waiting is you can go to menti.com, which you can see on the top of the screen at the moment, and you can use the code, which is 9903-3638. So if you go to menti.com, it just means that during the presentation, when we have things like polls and activities, you can actually join in with that. The other thing you can do just while you're waiting is you can head on over to the MedicMind Instagram and on our story we have opportunities to ask questions so just make sure you can see that because then during our sessions you'll be able to chip in your questions and we can see uh, what you're asking and we can answer your questions as we go through. Perfect. So I think the number of people joining is just starting to slow down now. So Shivam, do you want to sort of hit us off with an introduction? Yeah, of course. So um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our Medic Mind live work experience today. My name's Shivam. I'm a third year medical student at Nottingham University. Um, and alongside me today is Ellie. And Ellie is a current, well, F1 uh, well, going to be F1. Nearly. You, you just want to uh, introduce yourself a bit, Ellie. And Yeah, so my name's Ellie. I'm a final year student at Hull York Medical School. Um, as Shivan was hinting at there, I've finished my exams now. Um, so I'll be starting as an F1 in August. Um, I can just see some people saying that they can't hear in the chat. Uh, so we'll just give it a minute just to check that everyone can hear OK. And we've got all the tech problems ironed out before we get started. Yeah, I think it should be okay now. Um, you can still, you can hear me all okay, can't you, Ellie? Yeah. I can hear you, Shivam, okay. yeah. So, so we're going um, to we're gonna have a few people coming in and out today in terms of presentations. Um, we're going to have our co-founders of uh, MedicMind join us. We're going to have some people come in for, uh, to talk about the life of a, of a GP and the life of a doctor, the life of a foundation doctor. To give you an idea, I'm going to be talking a bit about preclinical medicine. So what it's like being a first year, second year student at medical school. Ellie's going to be talking about what it's like going into the clinical year. So starting going into hospital. Um, and then we'll have Mohill talking about being a foundation doctor. And then we have um, an exciting um, aspect of kind of GP work experience as well. Um, you know, obviously this is not in person. This is all um, live on <laughs> online. So we're going to make it as interactive as possible. And please, please, please ask any questions on our Instagram. Um, and we'll be looking at them throughout the day. So yeah, Kunal, was there anything else that you wanted to mention about today? Yeah, so um, just to mention to the people who have technical issues, um, obviously try to do the standard Zoom thing of working out how to turn on audio. You won't be able to unmute yourselves just because it'll be chaos if everyone can unmute themselves, but you should be able to hear. If you have any problems, we're also live streaming this on YouTube, and I've just sent the link in the chat. So if, if, if it works on there and it doesn't work on Zoom, then maybe that could be a good solution. Uh, but hopefully, I think most of you guys haven't got problems. And if you do have any problems, just drop a message in the chat. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so what I would just add about today. So as you're probably all aware, this is going to be quite a long session. So it's going to be around four hours. Within that time, we are planning on having a break in the middle. So at around quarter to four, four o'clock, we'll have a break for about 15 minutes to allow everyone to have a toilet break, get a drink. Um, but equally during and um, sort of in between our sessions as we go through, we'll also have opportunities for that as well. And um, so we will make sure we have plenty of breaks during the time. Amazing. So first thing we're going to do, Ellie, is go through a bit about the timeline of the application. So just so that everyone is aware, um, the UCAT exam is sat between July and September. So that is, a, as, as people are pro probably aware already, it's a very, very important entrance exam to get into 90 to 95 percent of all medical schools. Um, this exam, we always recommend starting preparation six to eight weeks before your exam mm -hmm. day. Preparing as early as possible is absolutely key. And again, we'll be sending so much kind of 
um, information to you guys about uh, what resources we can provide to you, what free resources, what extra resources you can have access to. Um, we then move on to the personal statement. So can you tell me, Ellie, when is the exact deadline for the UCAS application? Hopefully everyone has kind of got this ingrained into their head. Oh, you know what, Shivan, for this year, I actually don't, it's, it's around the 14th or 15th of October. Do you know off the top of your head? Yeah, it's exactly that. So mostly every single year, it's 15th of October. So a really, really important day that everyone should really just dot, jot down on a piece of paper right now and just be aware of. Um, you apply and, and send your UCAS application off. Uh, and that means that you have applied to four medical schools by that, mm -hmm. by that stage. Um, you then go into around September. So you can either sit the BMAT exam, Ellie, in September or November. Now, yes. one of the disadvantages of sitting that BMAT exam in November is that actually you have already applied to your medical schools and you are mm -hmm. now um, you are now basically sitting an exam, uh, sitting an, an exam that you have already applied to that university. So if that exam doesn't go very well, you've kind of squandered your chance of getting into that um, medical school. Can you tell me then, Ellie, what is the biggest advantage of this UCAT exam? Why did, why, first of all, why does everyone take the UCAT exam and why is it so useful in terms of getting your grades straight away? Yeah, so the UCAT compared to the BMAT, and some of you might know this if you've been to some of our previous webinars, the UCAT is required by nearly every UK medical school, whereas the BMAT is just required by a small handful of them. So pretty much everyone here will be sitting the UCAT exam, but then far fewer of you will sit the BMAT exam. The useful thing about the UCAT is, as Shivan was hinting at there, you get your results straight away with the UCAT. So what that means is once you have your result, you can then look at the medical schools you're applying to and figure out how likely you are to get offers from different medical schools. So this is something we call applying tactfully. So while it's obviously important to consider which medical schools you want to go to and thinking about their curriculum, where they are in the country, another important thing to look at is do they have a cutoff for their UCAT score? Because if they've told you they have a certain cutoff and you're below that cutoff, you really shouldn't apply there because you would essentially be wasting an application that you could put to another medical school where you're more likely to get in. So the advantage of getting that UCAT score in the summer is that you have then a couple of months to think about where you want to apply. Whereas with the BMAT, again, as Shivan was saying, depending whether you take it in September or November, you may or may not have your result to know whether you've got a good BMAT score for the universities that you're applying to. So generally, if you're going to take the BMAT in November, you might just apply to one or two BMAT medical schools and keep the rest UCAT, just because you already know your UCAT score. So it's a bit safer in that respect. So just consider with the timings, which exams you're taking, and just think about that in relation to which medical schools you're applying for. Yeah, perfect. That's a really good summary there, Ellie. And then, and then we've got mm -hmm. November and April time in um, year 13 is when you are then going to have your interview. So you're going to be, you know, this can really run for a very, very extended period of time. Your medical schools will get in touch with you and say you have a interview on X date. Um, and then you will just go to, go to the interview, whether that be in person or whether it be mm -hmm. online. Um, so this just gives you a nice idea of the timeline of the application. We're just gonna move on to the next slide, which is just a mm -hmm. quick a QR code. So anyone who isn't on, whatsapp group chat um, again this is a, a group chat for anyone who wants to understand where the recordings are a bit more information about medic mind a bit more information about the resources that we're giving out if you just join this um whatsapp group then you will be able to basically have access to all this uh, it's completely um well no one can actually chat on the group it's only us that will um write mm -hmm. stuff in the chat so, um, you know, just feel free to just scan this QR code very quickly um, if you haven't already joined the WhatsApp group. Chat. This will just, just allow you to, to be updated with everything. And also it means that um, some people who don't look at their emails as well, it, it's just a lot easier. Yeah. Um, Shivam, just before we go any further, would you mind just telling us a little bit about what Medic Mind is? Because I know some people have joined today who haven't joined any of our webinars before, and it might just be useful just to say a little bit about who we are as well as a company. Yeah, of course. Of course. So anyone who's just come in a bit later, just to kind of summarise. So Medic Mind is a uh, it's it's a company that have been helping medical, sorry, medical um, 
students in terms of people who want to go on and study medicine. So we help with the UCAT, the BMAT, we help with personal statements, and we also help with people who have interviews later on down the line. So the whole idea of it is having, um, giving students an opportunity to, you know, whatever background they come from, whatever help they need, we are there to kind of help them. So whether that be one-to-one -one tutoring, whether that be online resources. Um, Ellie and I have been um, doing these webinars for a very, very long time now. And we, we do them very constantly for UCAT, for interviews, for BMAT. Um, and the whole idea of them is for everyone to have a fair opportunity, for everyone to have an opportunity to understand a bit more about what Medic Mind is all about, what applying mm. to medicine is all about. At the end of the day, no one here should be scared of applying to study medicine. Um, but the, the whole path of going on to study medicine is quite scary. There are lots of different hurdles that you mm. need to overcome. Um, but if you just take them one step at a time, you'll realize that actually it's not as over overwhelming as you first thought. And actually, at the end of the day, it is all worth it. And that is something that we're going to be talking a lot about today. That's the whole idea of today's work experience is to give you an idea of what is being a medical student like. And also, I'm going to be just doing a bit of teaching as well, um, just in the next half an hour or so, just so everyone is aware of, of just a few things about, about medicine as well. Perfect. Thank you, Shivam. No worries at all. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide now. Um, and... Um, Ellie, do you just want to start us off with probably the most important part um, of today? And, it, and it, it's about how on earth during a time like this, do you get work experience opportunities? Do you get an insight into medicine, an insight into what it's like being a doctor? So do you just want to start off with the, the just the beginning of this list, just so everyone yeah. is, is aware of that? Absolutely. So everyone, as Shivam has been saying here, we are in the middle, obviously, of a global pandemic at the moment. But one important part of applying to medical school is as much as possible trying to get some work experience. And work experience is important for lots of different reasons, including finding out whether this is the career for you, um, including showing your commitment to medicine. So when you go to the interviews, you have experiences to talk about. So it's still important that you try to get that experience, even though hospitals and GP practices might not be letting you in at the moment. So we've got some lists here of some ideas of things you can do. And obviously webinars like this is one example. So this is a virtual work experience where we're talking about what it's like to be a medical student and a doctor. So that's one example. But we've got here a list of in-person work experience opportunities. And our next slide will talk about some virtual ones. So I'll just go through the first few of these. So the first one here is volunteer vaccinators. So some of you might have heard that with the COVID-19 vaccination uh, being rolled out across the UK, there are opportunities for members of the public to volunteer to either help administer vaccines or if not to be involved in the admin team in organising the vaccinations. So if you haven't already, it's worth looking at whether that's something you can do in your local area because it does vary depending what area you're in. But that's one way that you could get an experience of healthcare and of public health and of really being involved in an element of history even though you're not actually going into the hospitals. So that's one example. Also ambulance services. So that's things like St. John's Ambulance. I know, again, this is something that's really oversubscribed. So I remember when I was applying to medical school, I actually couldn't get involved in St. John's Ambulance because it was so oversubscribed in my local area. But it's worth trying. And certainly if at the moment, if you've got a while until you're applying, so either at the moment we're in March, so you might have time to join, or if you're actually a year in advance and you're joining this early, you might have time to join something like St. John's Ambulance. And Ellie, and, I just, just yeah. wanted to point a bit out uh, uh, about mm. ambulance services. Uh, this also links to um, things like um, emergencies and medical emergencies. Mm. So even things like first aid. So e understanding the very, very simple ABC. So Ellie, what does ABC stand for? Yeah, so ABC is airways, breathing and circulation. And it's the very first things you need to know in first aid. Exactly. So if, even if you are not a medical student, even if you are a year 13 student and you see someone who is in distress, you know, they might be on the floor, they might have collapsed. The first thing you ever, ever do is check someone's airway. You need to check is something blocking their airway, is something causing them to, to, to not be breathing. That's the most important part. If you're not breathing, you are not alive. Very, very simple. You then check things to do with breathing. So we've got airway and we've got breathing. So we need to check if someone is actually, you know, is their chest going up and down? 
Are they getting oxygen in and out? Are they struggling to do so? And then finally, Ellie, circulation, which is checking someone's pulse, um, checking if someone is actually pump, if their heart is actually pumping and they're getting oxygen, they're getting nutrients around to their body. So mm -hmm. three very important parts to think about. And this is where, this is an aspect that you can learn by, by, by taking on first aid courses, by yeah. doing things like St. John's Ambulance uh, to try and try and get in contact with your local um, emergency care provider and ask them, can I have a day um, shadowing or, or a day to understand what's it like treating medical emergencies? Really, really important because, you know, every, everyone who studies medicine needs to, you know, in, in a medical emergency, they need to know how to act. They need to know how to deal with pressure. So this is a really nice opportunity to see if, do you, do you, first of all, do you like the pressure? Do you like yeah. helping people in certain situations? Is it a bit too overwhelming for you? Um, again, really, really nice point that you mentioned, Ellie. Definitely have a look out for this. Um, and one thing that I'm going to stress about today, and Ellie, this is something that we mention all the time. Mm. Today is a work experience day. So what I want everyone to do every half an hour is to just have a piece of paper in front of them and just reflect on what you have learnt in that half mm -hmm. an hour chunk. You can do it in half an hour, you can do it in one hour. Tr reflection is the most important part of being a doctor. You need to reflect on what you do well. You need to reflect on what you didn't do well. So try to reflect throughout today. And the reason why I say that is when you go and write your personal statement, you have a piece of paper where you have written, you know, lots of different things. You've lo written lots about your reflection and then that will make it easier to write on your personal statement about pieces of work experience that you learned today. Brilliant. That's a really good point, Shivam. And yeah, I'd, I would massively recommend that to everyone is to be writing down just little things that you're learning throughout today, reflecting back on what you've learned in the past half an hour. Um, and also with this being quite a long session, hopefully that's something that will help keep you paying attention and feeling like you're really getting involved in these sessions as well. And as we've said, we will have polls and things throughout. But as Shivam was saying, actually, then when you get to your personal statement, if you've got notes like this, it's really useful because it reminds you of what you learned in your work experience. So not just a tip for this, but also a tip for any other experiences that you're having um, that might be applicable to your personal statement. Brilliant. So just moving slightly down this list again. So the next two are community COVID aid groups and NHS volunteer responders. So these are things that uh, have been very active throughout the pandemic. And it's things like um, going to do people's shopping if they're shielding, things like picking up prescriptions um, if you're someone who drives, you can uh, help people when they're discharged from hospital to take them home. So there's lots of options in terms of that. And again, it's just seeing what's available in your area, inquiring with local GP practices, local hospitals, and seeing what volunteer opportunities there are. The next one, Cool Companions. So this is something that actually I did for my work experience before going to medical school. Um, so this is the idea that you might not be physically going to someone to do your work experience, but you might be able to do care calls in some capacity. So the one that I did was with Age UK, where actually you just call up people who don't really get visitors and just feel a bit lonely. So you can call them up and ask them, how's your day been? And it's just about having a casual conversation with them, which you might not think that's that applicable to medicine, but actually a huge amount of what doctors do is just chatting with people. And it gets you a bit out of your box, engaging with other people. So cool companions is something I'd really recommend with different charities as well. And, yeah, Ellie, I just want yeah. to really stress this. So if if people are struggling to get in-person work experience, and again, mm -hmm. most of these things are all in-person things, I cannot stress to you how important things like call cool companions are. Mm -hmm. So try and get in contact with things like Age UK. Try and contact your local um, hospices. Try and yeah. contact your local care homes. Um, and that it will give you an opportunity to actually spend some time during the day calling people and talking to them you know, they might be feeling down, they might be feeling depressed, they might be missing their family, they might be going through a serious medical chronic condition, a really fantastic opportunity for everyone. So please, please, please try and just write this down, maybe tomorrow or during the week, you can have a go at looking into into this. Um, and again, the, the last one Ellie, is, is quite obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Hospital and GP placements. Um, this is kind of a pretty much a standard piece of work experience that, that people try to try to get. Again, not everyone does. I'd say around 60, 70 percent of medical students that I know probably had a bit of 
hospital GP work experience. Some people didn't at all. And that doesn't matter because if you have done some of these other things, then actually you, you are aware of what medicine is like, what, what, what treating people is like, what um, communication is like and why that's so important. So please don't stress too much about hospital and GP placements. Again, try and contact your local hospitals, try and contact your local GPs and ask them, yeah. can, I, can I come in for a day? It's very difficult during this time. So that's why we've stressed these key kind of five points mm -hmm. here, because this, this is something that's very realistic for everyone to do. And Shivam, would you say there's any advantage to doing the hospital placement over doing those other experiences? Or do you think they can be just as equally good as each other? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think you learn you learn different things in different areas. So obviously, mm -hmm. if you're in the hospital, you're going to know a bit more about what a doctor does physically. So, for example, clarking patients. So, Ellie, mm -hmm. do you just want to just briefly summarise what does clarking a patient mean? Yeah, so this is actually something when I deliver my section later, I will come back to, but it's broadly the idea that you're asking the patient questions and examining them briefly to find out what might be wrong with them and come up with a list of possible conditions that you can then investigate. So that's the idea of clerking a person. Okay, so for example, Ellie, I have come into A&E and I have <laughs> really, really serious pain um, in my tummy. Um, what are you going to do? And, and, and tell me a bit about clerking and tell me a bit about kind of um, what, what, what students might be seeing during their work experience in that sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if someone's come into A&E, serious pain in their tummy, I'd start off by asking them a few simple questions. So that would be things like um, any nausea and vomiting. Have they lost blood from anywhere? Have they had any medical conditions in the past we need to be aware of? What medications are they on? And it will just give us a rough idea of are we thinking of a peptic ulcer? Are we thinking of a gastritis? Are we thinking of an appendicitis? And once you've got that idea, you can decide, is this something really urgent I need to call all the team to immediately? Or is it something we can take a little bit slower? We can examine the person, have a feel of their tummy, listen to their tummy and arrange some scans. So really clerking the person is how you find out a bit more about what's going on and decide how quickly you need to act on it as well. And Ellie, I've got a really good tip for everyone today. And that is, if, if you ever see a patient very early on, you know, this is the start of medical school, maybe during your um, volunteering, maybe when you're um, providing some aid to, to for COVID support, try and think about things like who, what, where, when and why. And that will really help you. So, for example, Ellie, you've come into the hospital with really bad tummy pain. Mm -hmm. First of all, we need to check you know, your date of birth, your age, yeah. very important. So that's who, what, mm -hmm. so what has actually happened, Ellie? Did this happen yesterday or has this been going on for 10 years and mm -hmm. now it's suddenly getting really, really bad? Um, for example, things like when, when did it happen? When does it feel particularly bad? Um, mm -hmm. And why, for example, what are some triggers that is making it worse? So do you see, Ellie, this is very, very, very simple. I'm really breaking yeah. it down to things that you learn really in primary school and secondary school about the five, I think it's called the five W's. It's mm -hmm. who, what, when, why, where, and maybe how as well. So again, yeah. maybe write that down, maybe have a think about that. It's a really nice way to, um, to, 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 to actually reflect on experiences as well. So if, you, mm -hmm. if you're thinking, oh, I can't remember what happened that day, I really like to think about the five W's because it makes me actually improve my memory. Definitely, definitely. Perfect. So if we move to the next slide then. So we've just talked about the idea of in-person work experience, but I think we also need to acknowledge that even some of those opportunities at the moment might be a bit trickier than usual. So obviously still try everything we've suggested there, but virtual work experience opportunities are really important too. And today is one example of that. So with this list, I won't necessarily go through every point. Um, I believe we've also got a link that we can send to you, uh, which one of our colleagues might post in the chat that's just going to go through these experiences in more depth um, but each of these ideas so things like the Brighton and Sussex Medical School Scheme, Bright Ideas by Kent and Medway and um, the Doc Talk Virtual Work Experience these are all experiences either of modules or of several day experiences where you could do shadowing or you can just find out more about the role of a doctor so these are some really good ones that we've identified you might also know of others um, and if you know of others that's great. Equally, like observe GP, it's the idea that you can actually experience what you might see in a clinic 
but doing it in a virtual way as well. Um, so these are just some ideas and by all means, like have a Google, have a look. You can probably find a lot more than this as well. Is there anything you'd add to that, Shivam? Uh, what I would just say, Ellie, is um, mm. I'd highly recommend everyone just to have a look at the um, link that I think Mohil has put in the chat. So this is our Medic Mind um, kind of article that we've kind of written as a group as a big group and we have written lots of different aspects of kind of work experience and how to get work experience during this time and how to get additional kind of experiences in medicine again this talk today is 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 probably the first piece of work experience that maybe anyone has ever done in their life um so you know and or it might be someone's fifth or sixth or seventh piece of work experience so it doesn't matter where you are today the whole idea of today is to give you um, opportunities to, to understand a bit more about medicine and what it's like. Um, I'm just going to move to the next slide, Ellie. So hopefully you can see, still see this okay. Just very quickly as well, you've got other things like uh, the uh, MOOCs, which is basically um, online courses that you can do. Um, you've got different medical books, different, um, you know, different books that you can start reading now that I'd highly recommend um, looking into. I read The uh, Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, um, a very important book about cancer. Um, and then finally, uh, guys, anyone who, who is interested in podcasts uh, in there, in, in the meantime, you can you can have a look at some podcasts as well. So lots of different things to, 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 to look into. Um, again, this is the article. We've put it in the chat. Anyone who's struggling to find this article, I just put this QR code on for just a few seconds. Mm -hmm. um, just scan it and just have a look at the article and maybe a bit later on in the day or tomorrow. Um, and just have a quick read through that. Perfect. So any questions that you have about finding work experience or anything, just go to our Instagram and just type in a quick message on there if you've got any questions and we'll have a read through that throughout the day. So Ellie, I'm just going to begin talking a bit about being a pre-clinical medical student. So what is a pre-clinical medical student? And well, Ellie, do you want to tell me how, how is a medicine degree normally structured and what's the difference between preclinical and the clinical phases? Yeah, so I think this is something that a lot of people who've not been to medical school don't necessarily know the difference between preclinical and clinical. Um, and it's certainly something that used to confuse me. So preclinical means that you're spending most of your time at the university rather than on placement at GP and hospital. Whereas clinical is the other way around. So you'll spend most of your time on placement and less of your time at university. So different medical schools run this in slightly different ways. So some medical schools um, have far fewer years that are clinical based and some have far more. But generally across the board, it's two or three years of preclinical and two or three years of clinical. Um, so the way that we've split today will be Shivam talking about preclinical, so more the university based experiences in the earlier years. And then later on, I'll be talking about clinical, which is more the later years of medical school. Amazing. So I've just put this uh, picture on the screen here, Ellie, and this is one of my favourite pictures about applying to study medicine. Applying to study medicine really is a it's it's a race. It's a hurdle race where you have lots of different hurdles that you need to overcome. You start off with gathering experience. You gather your work experience. You then start visiting and choosing your universities. You then sit your UCAT exam or your BMAT exam. You write your personal statement and then finally you have your interview that you go to to kind of secure that place at medical school. And obviously I, I've actually missed one, haven't I, Ellie? And that, that's the A-level results. Obviously you need yes, to get absolutely. your results. Um, but this is a really nice metaphor to actually understand that um, any career, for example, things like uh, medicine or law, mm. they require you to go through different hurdles so that the medical schools can actually select the students that are appropriate for studying medicine. So what, why, Ellie, do they have such a kind of, a, um, not I wouldn't say difficult application process, I'd say, a, uh, um, I'm trying to find the word actually, it's, it's more of a, a structured approach where they have different hurdles to overcome. Why do they do that? What, what, why is that unique to medicine and dentistry? Yeah, so I think there are a few different reasons. I think one of the big reasons is actually to test your motivation. Um, because compared to a lot of other university courses, you'll submit your personal statement, you'll get your A-level grades and you'll get your place in university. 
we have to accept that things like medicine and dentistry are quite competitive. You are competing against other students. So having those extra hurdles just shows that you are dedicated and motivated enough, particularly given that you'll be entering a course that is potentially up to six years, depending where you're studying. So that's really important. And the other part is just because it shows more about you on the whole. The fact that you've got the personal statement that looks at one aspect of you, the UCAT looks at another aspect of you, your A-levels look at another aspect of you, the interview is another aspect so you get more of a holistic view of who you are as a person and that should in theory help to choose well-rounded candidates so it is important that you dedicate your time to all of these different elements because they are all important in getting into medical school oh, absolutely and I think any uh, I think this this picture actually applies for you Ellie as well you know once you start mm. Um, once you start training as a doctor, you know, there are different hurdles that you overcome. And again, we're, yeah. we're going to be talking about that in terms of um, how, what, what, what route you can go into to actually apply to study, to, to, to actually become a, a consultant, for example, or a GP. So what is the average day of a medical student? Well, this is what makes medicine incredible in that sense. And this is why I enjoyed um, studying medicine so much in my early kind of clinical phase. So Every day is very, very unique. I've got a few pictures here, and this first picture here actually is a bit about dissection. So, um, dissections is a it's a really unique thing to medical students, where you can have an opportunity to actually um, uh, dissect a cadaver. So, a cadaver means a person who has donated their body to science after they have died, and this is a huge privilege. You know, as a medical student, I was very, very humbled to actually have this opportunity, um, and. It's, it's an incredible experience. You can learn anatomy. You can learn about the human body, not by looking at a textbook, but actually seeing it in person. And that's what it's all about. Um, every day is very unique as a preclinical medical student, because um, Ellie, as, we, as I've got here, mm -hmm. this is kind of this kind of summarizes what a daily what a week is like, really. So we've got a mixture of lectures. So lectures are where you go in person. You're, you're there as a big year group, maybe 200, 300 students, and you're being taught in, in kind of a big classroom. You've then got small group teaching, which is maybe in groups of five people. That's probably going through certain cases and going through, let's say, for example, Ellie, recently I had a small group teaching on um, medical ethics. So mm -hmm. understanding a bit about autonomy and beneficence. Hopefully these words are, are, are words that you've maybe heard before. So autonomy, Ellie, do you just want to summarize what autonomy means? Yeah, so autonomy is a patient's own right to make decisions over their mind and body. So, for example, a doctor wouldn't uh, dictate what a patient has to do. They would present options, give information. They might encourage down a certain route, but ultimately the patient makes the decision over what it is that they want. Exactly. So just to clarify that to everyone, autonomy is a patient's right to make their own decisions. Doctors can advise patients. Doctors can tell patients, OK, I, I believe that you should take this medication. It will help you. Um, I would recommend doing X, Y, Z. But at the end of the day, the patient has that kind of final um, kind of d d decision at the end of the day. You yeah. then got other things, Ellie, and, and this is quite an important point here that I've put about interprofessional learning. So interprofessional learning, it's kind of in the name. It means learning about different professions and working with different professions. Mm. So you, um, I, I've spent a lot of time actually having sessions with pharmacists and nurses and physiotherapists. So can you tell me, Ellie, why do you think that would be really, really useful? Yes, I think it's really useful because when you become a doctor, you only really see in your role and actually knowing what other people do, what their daily experiences are like, helps you to appreciate how you can best work with them as a team. Because ultimately, you're working with physios, pharmacists, nurses, all together in caring for a patient. So if you don't know what it is that they do, what their experiences are, what they're good at, then it's very hard for you to work with them in that team. So it is important as part of medical education as well. So, so important. Ellie, this is, this is an aspect of medical school, which I didn't really know about until I started. And that was understanding about um, working in a team. And working, mm. uh, working not only as a team with other doctors and other medical students, but also with other courses. This was a fantastic opportunity for me to actually meet people from other courses and actually spend time with them and understand what do they actually do during their kind of time at time at university as well. We've then got things like microbiology. So this is where, uh, again, I've got a picture on the left where we might spend a bit of time in, in a lab 
where we're, we're looking at things under the microscope. We're appreciating, you know, how small things are in, in, mm -hmm. in our body with, with respect to, um, for example, a blood vessel. We're looking mm -hmm. at um, a cross section of a blood vessel. We're understanding a bit more about uh, the kind of um, uh, smaller aspects of, of different parts of our body. So um, and finally, Ellie, we have early clinical practice and uh, in the hospital and also GP huge huge aspect that has come into play over the last few years so what used to happen ellie is as you're probably aware of there was a huge mm. divide between your your time at medical school there used to be a very big pre-clinical stage which was you know yeah. you just you just go to lectures you just do learning 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 from a textbook and then suddenly one day you go to the hospital and then you spend two three years in the hospital now what all the medical schools are starting to do is integrate the two so what that means, Ellie, is that I had the opportunity, and I'm sure that you had too, to mm. every kind of couple of weeks, we would spend maybe a day in a GP or, or day in a hospital to just appreciate, you know, at the end of the day, Ellie, we're going to become doctors. So we should we should be seeing patients at an early stage, shouldn't we? Um, do you yeah. just want to talk a bit about what your early clinical phase was like? Do, what, what did you, What kind of experiences did you have there? Yeah, so for me, because I'm, um, so I go to Hull York Medical School, as I said, right at the start. So for me in first year, we would spend half a day a week, either at the hospital or at the GP, and it would alternate each week. Then in second year, it'd be a full day. And then third year, it was then full time in placement. And during those days, we'd have the chance to speak to actual patients. Um, so the GP would generally invite somebody in who had an interesting condition. We'd practice asking them questions, practice exams examining them um, and have tutorials with the GPs. So it was that one time in the week where we could actually put into practice our learning from throughout the week. Um, how does that compare to your experience, Shivam? Well, I'll actually tell you, Ellie. So the, the first time I ever went to the hospital, um, one of the consultants told me to take a history from a patient. And this patient um, seemed to be in a bit of distress. They were complaining of some pain. Um, and I kind of asked the, asked the patient, I was, I, I asked them, what, what type of pain are you in? And they were like, oh, it really, really hurts. And one of the things, Ellie, that you learn at medical school is a bit about um, where the pain radiates in your body. Mm. And I, I asked him, okay, so this pain that you've got, does, is it, he, he mentioned it was in his knee. And I said, does it radiate down your leg? Does it radiate up your leg? And the patient ignored me. He, she, he, he completely ignored me and he didn't talk to me at all. And I was wondering, I looked at the consultant, I was like, I have no idea what's going on here. And then it was when, after about five minutes, Ellie, but I realized that he was actually amputated and he didn't actually have a leg. And that was probably the biggest shock of my life. And it made me realize that I have, I have, I have spoken to this patient, I've asked them questions and I haven't even looked at their body properly. I haven't even looked at them from kind of just taking a step back. Um, and that was probably most embarrassing moment of my life. You know, obviously all my friends were kind of laughing and, and I went very, very red. But actually from that day onwards, every time I've gone into the hospital, I before I even talk to the patient or after I've introduced myself, I'll just take a bit of time to just have a look, have a look around. Have they got a big um, walking frame with them? Have they got um, a walking stick? Have they got, you know, five asthma pumps by their bedside? Um, you know, huge, huge things that, that you can tell about a patient before even talking to them. So this is that's the whole point of the early clinical phase is to make huge mistakes, make embarrassing mistakes so that you you will learn from that and, and, and you can kind of progress through the years. Um, Absolutely. And um, Shivam, could I just jump in with a question? Um, yeah, so you mentioned earlier about dissections um, and you explained sort of a bit about what that involves with uh, people who've donated their bodies and so on. Um, some people here might be aware that some medical schools do prosections rather than dissections. Mm -hmm. Would you mind just telling us a little bit about what the difference is and why for you dissections was good? Because I've had prosections, which is quite different. Yeah, of course. So it's a really good question, Lee. So prosections means that you you have an already dissected piece of the body. So, for example, you might if you're learning about the hand or the arm, you might have a hand or arm that has been dissected by a professional. And you can have a look at that and you can observe, you know, what bl blood vessels can mm -hmm. I see? What what muscles can I see there? Now, the full body dissection, Ellie, was very unique because you could actually see the whole body of, 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 of a person who um, and, and just appreciate how you go about um, delving into the body. So, for example, understanding how, how, how thick is the skin? 
how mm. thick is, is, is someone's fat tissue? How thick is someone's muscle? So when you start dissecting like that, you start appreciating aspects of the body. And that, that's, what, mm. that's why I found it very, very useful. And that's why dissection was um, really quite an amazing kind of experience from medical school and it's specifically the earlier stages. Um, so what I've got on the screen here, Ellie, is just a timetable mm. from um, just a random week of, I think, first year or second year of medical school. And this, this just gives you an idea. So, you know, here we have some lectures at the beginning about digestion and absorption. We have some um, bits about embryology, histology. So histology is mm -hmm. looking under things for, on a microscopic level. Um, and then here, look, we can see on Monday afternoon, I had uh, my dissection uh, time. We can then see here, Ellie, on the Tuesday, I had a whole day where I actually went to a GP. And uh, again, this, this wouldn't happen every week. It was maybe every other three, four weeks. Um, and Ellie, can you notice something about the timetable? Again, I'll, I'll put another timetable up here. Um, again, the Tuesday had lots of things for different mm -hmm. students. So that's why I just put a big um, white bit room uh, there, not to confuse everyone. Um, but majority of the time mm -hmm. here, Ellie, what can you spot about Wednesday afternoon? So your Wednesday afternoon doesn't seem to have anything scheduled there. And I must say that was the same as me uh, in early medical school. Could you tell us what that's about, Shivam? Yeah, absolutely. So every single student at any UK um, uh, university will always have Wednesday afternoon off. And that Wednesday afternoon off is to play sport. It's to play sport for your university. It's to play sport for your maybe local society. Um, so this is pretty, pretty much a standard. Um, Ellie, here I've got GP visit there. But, you know, the, the following week, the whole Tuesday might be completely blank and I might have mm -hmm. nothing at all. Um, this is, as you can see, it's quite a busy week. Um, mm -hmm. this week as you can probably tell but actually you know things change uh, during the week so you know in this next year it's quite a busy week again um, but but this really really it varies you know one week I might have Thursday morning or the whole of Thursday off I might have the whole of Friday off but the reason why I chose really busy weeks is just so you, everyone can appreciate what is going on during the week you know you can mm -hmm. see that I've got a bit of pharmacology I've got a bit about introduction to the lower GI tract. So we can see here, Ellie, that there's a mix of things, isn't there, about these different words. And these words, yeah. Ellie, are words that I'm going to be talking about, um, hopefully in the next slide. Here it is. So um, preclinical medicine, Ellie, is all about mm -hmm. building foundations from A-levels and really understanding the different kind of systems in the body and how the body is working. So these are four words, Ellie, that I really didn't have an idea about before I started medical school. I don't know about you. No, not at all. <laughs> so that's why I want to tell everyone about this today. So what does anatomy mean? Now, everyone's probably heard of anatomy. Maybe Gray's anatomy has come up a few times. Um, anatomy just means the structures of the body. So understanding what are the different structures of the body. We have muscles. We have bones. Mm -hmm. um, what is the largest organ of our body, Ellie? Uh, well, technically, the largest organ of the body is the skin. I don't know if that's the one you're getting at. <laughs> exactly. You know, I it's I always got tricked out. I always used to think it was the liver and then I always used to get it wrong. Yes, it is the skin. The skin is the largest organ of the body, uh, potentially even the heaviest as well. Um, so that's a bit about anatomy. Now, physiology. What on earth is physiology, Ellie? Well, physiology is understanding the function or the mechanism of that structure in the body. So, for example, I might learn about the anatomy of the heart. Now, for example, the heart has different valves. It has mm -hmm. an atrium, it has a ventricle. Well, two atriums, two ventricles. Um, however, they serve a function, don't they? But the whole point of, those, mm -hmm. of, the, of the atrium and the, and the ventricles is to pump blood, to pump blood to different parts of the body. And that is what physiology is about. It's understanding, it really, really, um, if anyone is um, confused about what physiology means, just think about why why is something happening and, and that that will give you an idea of what physiology is all about pathology um pathology is all about diseases isn't it ellie uh, it's the effect it's the cause of disease mm -hmm. um when we learn about pathology we learn about um why does the virus cause the disease why does a bacteria cause the disease for example and then finally some a word that probably everyone is aware of because they're learning at a level or gcse is biochemistry so this is looking at things at the molecular level and i've just put a picture here to just understand you know a bit about how how is dna made up how how, how do proteins and enzymes work 
this is really important to learn as a preclinical medical student so that you can appreciate how the body works. And that really sums up what preclinical medicine is all about. It's understanding what on earth is the body. Yeah. So Ellie, on my next slide, I'm going to actually go through a, a, um, an example. So just, I'm going to talk a bit about hypertension. Mm -hmm. So what is hypertension, Ellie? Hypertension is where you have blood pressure that is higher than most of the population. Exactly that. So um, a lot of people have probably heard of high blood pressure. They might have a family member that has high blood pressure um, and it's very, very common um, around the world. Now, if we let's say we're talking about high blood pressure, we're talking about hypertension. Now, what would we actually learn about in, in the lectures, Ellie? Well, we would learn about the anatomy to begin with. So the anatomy of the blood vessels. And I've got a few pictures here just to understand, you know, how, how, how on, what on earth makes up a blood vessel? You know, there's different layers to, to the blood vessel. Um, um, some parts of the blood vessel are contracting to, to, to shrink it. Some bits are dilating to, to widen, widen the blood vessel. So for example, when you get very, very hot, your uh, blood vessels can dilate uh, to, so that you're getting rid of kind of extra heat there. Physiology. So I mentioned physiology in the last slide. Why, 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 why? So why on earth, Ellie, would the blood vessel um, contract? Why would it dilate? Well, the reason for that is to maintain blood pressure. So for example, when I'm sitting down and when I move to a standing up position, what happens to my blood pressure, Ellie? Uh, so initially, when you go from sitting down to standing up, your blood pressure will initially drop because you're waiting for your blood vessels to compensate. So then Shivam, why is it that we don't suddenly faint then every time we stand up? Exactly. So we have, uh, I know a lot of my friends um, actually suffer from this. It's, it's called po postural hypertension is the exact mm -hmm. word. And it's where when they stand up very, very quickly, they start to get really faint and dizzy. And that's mm -hmm. because their blood pressure is very, very low all of a sudden because um, blood basically isn't getting to your brain quick enough. And so mm -hmm. what, does, what does the body do then, Ellie? Well, what the body does is it, it constricts the blood vessels. It, it's called vasoconstriction. Mm -hmm. And that will constrict the blood vessels to in, increase your blood pressure so that you don't faint and that you still get blood going into your brain. Now, another lecture that we might have early during the week is a bit about pharmacology. So pharmacology is about how do drugs, um, how do drugs work really? It's, it's, it's all about drugs, it's pharmacy. So um, pharmacists, they spend a lot of their time during um, their time at university learning about how drugs work. So do medical students. We need to know how does taking a drug impact the blood vessels? Can we, can we, de can we dilate the blood vessels? Can we constrict the blood vessels? Mm -hmm. And finally here, Ellie, probably the most important part is pathology, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. what, what, what damages um, uh, blood vessels? So can you just tell me very, very briefly, Ellie, um, I've got a picture here on mm -hmm. the screen. This is, um, I'm, I'm going to explain this actually, just very briefly, yeah. because people probably aren't aware of the terminology. So atherosclerotic, I'm going to break that up into two words. Sclerotic, sclerotic means the hardening of something. So um, sclerotic means the hardening of something. So what that basically means is your blood vessels are, are, are hardening, they're getting stiff. Mm -hmm. So then Ellie, what on earth does afro mean? Well, afro, can you tell me Ellie, what does afro mean? Yeah, so it stands for atheroma, uh, which is essentially the buildup of a fatty plaque in most settings that we're talking about. Exactly, so what we've got here is two words, afro meaning um, kind of fat or the buildup of fat. We then got sclerosis or sclerotic, which means the hardening. Mm -hmm. So if um, people are on a um, very unhealthy, high cholesterol diet, lots and lots of kind of inappropriate fat that they're consuming, they might start to build up this fat in their blood vessels. And that can lead to an atherosclerotic plaque, which just means a fatty hardening of the blood vessel. Very, very simple. Mm -hmm. Don't overcomplicate complicate anything guys um, and what that can do is that can narrow the blood vessel so much that what happens Ellie? So eventually what can happen is if this plaque ruptures you get a blood clot that vessel can actually block entirely um, and that's got a whole range of consequences so that can be things like heart attacks like strokes and um, so that's where you start to get real complications from these problems. Exactly. So what's what's happening there is if this builds up so much, we're actually going from that to nothing 
no blood can travel through that blood vessel. And that is obviously very dangerous because you're not getting blood going to, to your muscles and most importantly to your brain. If you've got no blood going to your brain, you're going to shut down. Um, if you've got no blood going to your heart, Ellie, you might have a heart attack. Your, your heart will stop working. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that makes sense. I'll just repeat that one final time. Atherosclerotic. So athero means kind of fatty buildup. Sclerotic means hardening. Okay, really nice terminology that everyone should kind of be aware of now. Um, and maybe that will help, you know, when you when you um, kind of see patients, when you appreciate why people might have high blood pressure. So, Ellie, I'm just going to talk a bit about intercalated degrees, research opportunities and reading papers. So when you when you go to medical school, Ellie, you can have an opportunity to actually do an intercalated degree. Mm -hmm. So an intercalated degree, Ellie, basically means doing an extra degree on top of your medicine degree, which, you know, sounds well, it's a lot of people. It sounds ridiculous. You know, why on earth would you do another degree on top of your medicine <laughs> degree? Um, well, the reason for that, Ellie, is actually appreciating this all important part that I've got here. It's called evidence based medicine. One thing I really want everyone to take away from today is understanding what does evidence based medicine mean? Well, Ellie, do you just want to summarize um, when you're in hospital? When do you use evidence based medicine and, and why is it why is it always in your head? Yeah, so you are essentially using evidence based medicine all the time as a doctor. It takes slightly different forms. Um, but say if you're working in A&E and you're following some guidelines to do a certain procedure, well, that's evidence based because that's based on trials. It's based on people before you researching what is the best thing to do. Or if you're in a general practice, you might actually do a literature search and look at oh, what would be the best medication in this situation. So everything we do as doctors is based on the evidence that has come before us. Exactly, Ellie. So imagine if you were, let's say, a 50 year old consultant and you were just thinking about things that you learned from medical school. So certain treatments that you learned at medical school. Can you imagine 20 years on? things have changed very rapidly. There might mm -hmm. be a new drug, there might be a new um, guideline in place. And if you're not aware of that new kind of piece of research that has come out, you might actually be using an incorrect way of kind of helping the patient. So that's why um, people do these extra degrees. And, and actually that's why research is so important because research is, is, is all about, well, if we don't have research, then doctors can't actually treat patients in the best way possible. So like I have, uh, I've got here a nice Venn diagram just to show you need to have three particular things for evidence-based medicine. You need the best evidence. So how do you get the best evidence, um, Ellie? What, what, where, where, for example, we, we can relate this to COVID, can't we, in terms of the vaccination? So where do we get this best evidence from? Yes, yeah, so it's a mixture. So originally that's going to come from things like trials. So when you're trialing out drugs, vaccinations, um, but on a day to day, it would be from a doctor doing a research for papers and things like that and looking in journals for that evidence. Exactly. Um, so, Ellie, did you know, um, I don't know um, if, if you if you know too much about um, kind of how different universities work in terms of the intercalated degrees? Yeah, so it's, it's quite a mixture. So there'll be some medical schools where you are required to do an intercalated degree. Um, so it's worth being aware of that when you're applying to medical schools, look at whether intercalation is mandatory. And if it is, do you have to do it at that university or can you do it somewhere else? So that's one thing. Some medical schools um, say it's optional. So that might be that just some people in the year choose to intercalate and you might need to apply to do that and again that might be at that university or it could be at any university um, and less commonly would be if you're not allowed to intercalate but actually there's none that come to my mind that don't let you at all but it's worth having a look at the med school website so for example for me um, I study at Hull York but I did my intercalation at King's College so I was allowed to go elsewhere for that um, and look at the different courses that are available because you different universities will offer different courses for intercalation. Um, so Shivam, I understand that you did intercalate um, and as part of your intercalation you also did a dissertation as well. Do you want to just tell us a bit more about your experience and what you actually did? Yeah of course. So actually Ellie, I technically didn't actually do an intercalated degree. So my degree at Nottingham is quite unique in the sense that my degree is five years long but not only do I get a Bachelor of Medicine 
slash bachelor of surgery i also get a um, bachelor of medical science and that's integrated within the five years which again mm -hmm. um is quite unique to kind of nottingham and i also think southampton as well um now what i did ellie is i to be honest i, I chose the most interesting topic known to man which is constipation i wrote a dissertation all about um, opioid medication and constipation and how actually the two are, are increasing in the UK. I'm um, actually, if I go to the next slide, I think I've got a picture here. So there it is on the right hand side, an 8,000 word dissertation on is there a relationship between changes in hospital admissions for constipation and opioid prescribing? And it was a correlation study over 20 years. So I looked at 20 years worth of data. It was quite stressful, you know, um, it took a lot of time. Uh, but it was such a big learning experience. And after I uh, submitted my dissertation, as you can see on the left, I was extremely happy, absolutely ecstatic. <laughs> but it was probably probably the biggest learning experience um, in, in my life in terms of understanding a bit about research and how to write a paper. So Ellie, I'm going on to the next bit about just a bit about some anatomy that... that mm -hmm. Um, and Ellie, do you just want to tell everyone why am I doing this? Why on earth am I just talking a bit about things like to do with anatomy? Yeah, so I think essentially it's really useful to have an idea of the kinds of things you might cover at medical school. Um, so for everyone here, hopefully you've all got an interest in going to medical school, learning things like anatomy. Um, so from Shivam delivering just a few of these topics today, it gives you a flavour of what to expect. Um, and also, I think many of us, when we actually started medical school, we didn't know any of this. And it is just nice to go into a session and have a bit of a grounding. So you don't need to remember everything thing that Shivam says by any means but even just learning a bit of it is really nice. I, Ellie my aim today is for everyone to understand two bits uh, to do with the planes of the body so I'm going to talk about that right now. So what do I mean by the planes of the body? Well what I mean Ellie is say for example you have a, um, a prosection so that means someone has uh, a cut, cut up um, someone who, who has um, donated their body to, mm -hmm. to science and they might have done that in a coronal plane. So basically it's in a plane where they cut, cut right down from the head through, through the body down to their toes, okay? So what's a nice way to remember that? Well, a nice way to remember that is the coronal plane, think about wearing a crown. So if I was to wear a crown um, and then I had kind of a, a big um, knife running down my body and it cut me in half, almost down the crown, um, I would be split in half uh, and that, that gives you an idea of what you can see in my body. So for example here, Ellie, um, if, I did, if I had a coronal cut of the brain, we can mm -hmm. see here that this is a, a cut down, down here and we can see that that is the kind of front aspect of the brain that we can see, okay? So really nice way to remember, remember it, guys, is coronal plane. Corona, I think, comes from... Um, it comes from the Greek word. I think it means crown mm. anyway, actually. So think about wearing a crown. Um, and you basically, you're wearing a crown and it's cutting all the way down through your body. And here's an example um, of the brain. So a coronal kind of plane of, uh, of the brain. Sagittal. Now sagittal, we can see here is a cut, which is going this way. It's a midline cut going down my body. Now, nice way to think about sagittal is think about the side. So every time you have a sagittal cut, you're looking at the body, you're looking at something from the side. So here we can see a really a nice sagittal cut through the body and we can see um, kind of the, the, the spine, the spinous processes. We can see um, the liver there, can't we? We can see a bit of the kind of small intestines. And again, this is a sagittal cut of the head. So this is a, a side view of the head. And then again, it's really easy to remember transverse just means across. So you can have a transverse cut um, and that could be anywhere through my body, a transverse cut like that. OK, so hopefully everyone can remember that coronal plane. Think about the crown. Think about a cut going down the body like that. Sagittal, think about the side. It's a midline cut going this way. So what about a CT scan? Well, Ellie, when I started medical school, I looked at this CT scan and I had no idea what rotation it was in, mm -hmm. what was going on. Now I'm going to break this down really, really simply, Ellie. So, so how does a CT scan work? Well, I'm not going to go into that. Basically, 
in too much detail. All it is is multiple x-rays. So pretend you, you were cutting a courgette in, and, and you were cutting the courgette into lots of small pieces. That's basically what, what a, a CT scan is. It's lots of x-ray pieces showing different parts of the body. So the way to remember um, looking at a CT scan is pretend that the patient's feet are in your face and that their head is going you know, into the computer screen and is kind of coming out the other side of a computer screen. So the, the way that I always remember it is the patient's feet would be right in my face. So how, how can we kind of appreciate this, Ellie, in this um, CT scan? Well, this is a patient lying down flat, their feet is, is at my head and their, their brain or their head is, is kind of going on the other side of the, of the computer screen. And we can see here, the, you can very, very clearly see that these are the spines. So would this be the front of the body, Ellie, or the back of the body? So if their feet are towards you, the head is away from you, they're going to be lying on their back. So what you can see at the bottom there and um, sort of the larger chunk of white would be where their spine is. And um, so you are looking at their back at the bottom there. Exactly. So this is the back and this is the front. So, for example, if a patient was lying down and I put a apple, let's say, on, on, on the patient's um, on the patient's tummy, um, or in this case, this is actually a CT scan, a bit of the heart here. So let's say I, I got an apple and I put the apple on top of the patient at their, at their heart level. Um, I would see the apple up here, wouldn't I? Um, I would see the apple right at the top of the patient. So mm -hmm. very, very simple, guys. I just want to really make this very clear to everyone so they appreciate how the CT scan, um, how to kind of look at the CT scan and know which direction, which plane you're working in. Any CT scan you ever, ever see in your entire life, think about the patient's feet being right in your face and the patient's body being, you know, on the other side. And always, 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 um, you know, if you see a spine, you know that that is going to be the back. So this is the patient lying down flat. You know, they're lying down like this. Their feet is towards me and we can see their spine is processed there at the back. OK. And again, I've just got another picture there. Uh, it's a different plane of the body so we can actually see here if we want to be specific this is actually the pancreas here and that's the kidneys um, and again very very easy always find the spinous process so we know that this is the back and that this is the kind of the tummy area remember if I put an apple on this person I'd see the apple here right at the top um, and their feet are, the feet are right in my face okay so Ellie I'm just going to talk a bit about what I enjoyed mm. the most at university in terms of a preclinical stage. So very, very briefly, what I really enjoyed, it was the, the kind of social aspect of being in a hall um, and the university experience of so getting to know lots and lots of people. One of the things I thoroughly enjoyed, Elliot, about medical school, the first two, three years of medical school is just the variety of each day. You know, on a Monday, I might have dissections. Monday afternoon, I might have some small group teaching. On Tuesday, I might be going to a GP. On a Wednesday, I might be learning about how drugs work. On, mm -hmm. on Thursday, I might understand about different diseases and how bacteria kind of infect the body. OK. Another thing I really, really liked, Ellie, about kind of the, about medical school in general is, is, is the sporting aspect, the societies, you know, the thousands of societies that you can join. Um, and then finally, Ellie, a really big point is when you go to medical school, you, you start to realize that you're in this together. Every mm -hmm. medical student is there to help. You know, everyone's helping each other out. There's no there's no fierce competition at all. Everyone there is is there to learn. We're there to learn about yeah. the human body. We're, we're there to learn to, to be the best doctors that we can be. So it was just absolutely amazing starting medical school and realizing that everyone was just so um so kind to, to one another and, and and everyone wanted to learn from each other you know mm -hmm. I, I might have strengths or weaknesses that are very different from yourself Ellie and and you know that means that I want to learn lots from you and and, and vice versa yeah. so that was a really really big aspect that I enjoyed at, at medical school um I didn't actually go skydiving like this but I, <laughs> I just liked it because it just yeah I just liked it um, Shivam, if it's all right, there's a couple of questions yep. from the Instagram that are really relevant to this yeah, slide. So one of the questions was, do you think it'd be possible to maintain a high level of sport while you're at medical school? <laughs> it's a really, really good question. And um, the blunt answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, so 
in terms of sport, sport is such a big aspect of being a medical student. You know, there are lots of sporting activities that you can get involved in. Um, and, and there's so much time to do sport. So, for example, in, in my mm -hmm. early clinical years, Ellie, I was playing badminton, football, cricket and table tennis, you know, lots of different sports. Um, you have opportunities to, you know, rent a, a, um, a badminton court out and go and play with your friends. Remember, Wednesday afternoon is all about sports. So everyone in the mm -hmm. whole of the UK will be playing sport in, on Wednesday afternoon. Um, one of my very, very close friends, Ellie, uh, called Tintin. So Tintin Ho is actually a, a professional table tennis player who is, is in my year group. And she um, got a silver Commonwealth medal when she Amazing. was 15 years old <laughs> and she is currently actually I think she's um, in Qatar trying to qualify for the Olympics um, the Tokyo Olympics and she is a medical student in my year so that kind of sums up you can be an Olympic athlete um, you can be a Commonwealth athlete and still study medicine so that really summarizes yes you can absolutely balance sport um, for sure Brilliant. And the other question was, yeah. um, because you've described there a lot of the things that you enjoyed were really the social aspect and the mm. societies. Um, how would you describe the workload at medical school? And do you think it is something that can be balanced against the more social aspect as well? Yeah, again, a really fantastic question. So um, when you go to university, Ellie, a university is very, very challenging for everyone, whether you study English or maths or history. It's very challenging because it's a new type of learning. It's, it's quite independent. You need to start understanding how, what is the best way to revise and use your time efficiently. But Ellie, like any other degree, um, medicine is there is all about balance you need to balance your time you need to balance um, your your work-life balance absolutely and 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 that's what that's what medical students actually are very generally very very good at they're very yeah. good at realizing okay I've worked hard during the day I've worked hard during the week I'm going to spend a bit of time to myself I'm going to spend a bit of time doing what I love doing so it really mm -hmm. comes down to that kind of key phrase you know it's a bit of a cliche but I kind of really like it it's work hard um play hard you know that's what kind of yeah. medical school is all about that's what university in general is about and um, I think every degree is challenging in their own kind of right and own respect and um, yes medicine you know is challenging because there's a lot of content to go through but actually when you start breaking things down you know like I just did there early with the coronal yeah. plane the sagittal plane you know when you start breaking things down actually it becomes very very kind of easy to remember and and mm -hmm. it becomes um just rem just remember everyone's in the same boat so yeah. um everyone wants to kind of work really hard but also wants to get involved in lots of societies and sports for sure mm -hmm. okay and just to, I, again this is just a recap here Ellie you know that at, at medical school you're going to have loads of opportunities to play sports um, there are loads of societies to join and in particular I just want to stress this um medical students have are very very privileged to have their own society which is called the MedSoc and what the MedSoc means is that, for example, there might be MedSoc football or MedSoc volleyball or MedSoc netball. And what that means is that that is um, a sport that is just for medical students. So it just means that, you know, even if you feel like you're struggling with work life balance, you will always be able to play sport because you can do it within a society within MedSoc. Um, so, again, have a look at, at different universities, guys. Have a look at what, what kind of MedSoc sports do they offer? Uh, they'll all offer kind of the main the key the key ones of course um again preclinical medicine it's an opportunity to learn a bit about yourself in terms of independent living you might be living in halls you might be living in accommodation um and this is a really important aspect ellie a medicine year group is unlike any other subject so what i mean by that is you get very very close with your year group because you know you're, you're with each other for, for five years you, you get mm -hmm. to know each other really well and you get to kind of understand each other and, and understand that how, how do you become a good doctor how do you work together Doc uh, becoming a doctor and being a medical student is all about teamwork and then finally Ellie I talked a bit about the extra degrees didn't I and just a bit about getting yeah. involved in research you can do an intercalated degree you can write a dissertation mm -hmm. so what are the kind of big take-home points from kind of this um small bit that i've talked about here really well preclinical medicine is just about getting stuck in you're starting university it's very scary for everyone but you just have to get stuck in university experience is all about what you put in so if you're willing to put yourself out there if you're willing to work hard if you're willing to play hard mm -hmm. you'll get a really really good university experience um look into let's different sports and societies so for example particularly med socks so that's the medical societies 
And then the next bit here is appreciate the topics covered in preclinical. So I've, I've talked a bit about this today, Ellie, haven't I? Understanding what does what does anatomy mean? What does physiology mean? What does biochemistry mean? What does pathology mean? And hopefully everyone understands a bit about that. Remember, anatomy is about the, the structures in the body. Um, physiology is about why that happens. Um, pathology is about the diseases of the body. Um, pharmacology is about the drugs that impact the body. And again, um, the kind of cliche phrase, but very, very important, work hard, play hard, that we've stressed. And again, anyone who missed that about the sagittal plane and the coronal plane, one last time, please remember it. Coronal is like wearing a crown and it's mm -hmm. a plane going down the body. So basically if someone cut you in half down this way um, and sagittal plane is a midline and you can see a kind of side view. So it's that, that, that thing there. So I've talked for a long time, Ellie. Um, <laughs> I really hope that everyone found that useful. Um, lots of things to kind of think about. Maybe take a bit of time to actually reflect on what you've learned over, over the kind of the last half an hour, 45 minutes that I've talked about. Um, and yeah, any questions about that at all, just put a quick message on, on our Instagram page and we'll be more than happy to answer that. Um, so Ellie, I'm going yeah. to hand over to yourself. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Shivam. I know that was quite a lot of content to go through and well done to everyone who was stuck with this throughout that. And hopefully you've all had at least a few points there that you can take away from Shivam's presentation. Um, so in terms of the questions on Instagram, actually, Shivam, you've covered the vast majority as we've gone through. I know some people have had quite individualised questions, um, which hopefully we can come back to at a later point. But I think it's probably a good idea for everyone to have a five minute break break now just because that's a lot of content before we move on to the next part of the presentation and that'll also just give me and Shivam a chance to swap who's sharing screens as I'll be leading the next section um, so everyone feel free to take a break and come back just before 20 past and then we'll start the next section of the presentation. One thing just to mention guys is that um, it's probably better not to leave the call. It's better just to maybe just mute your screens and then come back to it just in case you have issues joining back. But yeah. yeah, perfect. So just to confirm everyone, we'll be back at 3.20. So make sure you're back at uh, 3.20 um, and we'll just be continuing. And Ellie will be going into the clinical phase of medicine. Um, what it's like starting hospitals, going into GPs and starting the real kind of nitty gritty of meeting patients. So have a good break for about four or five minutes and we'll return um, very, very soon.
So just a note to anyone who's still at your computers at the moment, if you haven't walked away, now's a really good time to do what Shivan was advising with just getting a piece of paper, try and write down a couple of things that you learned from Shivam's section there. So a couple of things that might be useful for your personal statements or as memory prompts later on. So while you've got a couple of minutes now, if you haven't left your computer, just make a note of a couple of reflections from Shivam's section before we get started. Okay, so just again, for anyone who didn't hear what I just mentioned there, and um, so now that you've had a bit of a break, for anyone who's just coming back, now's a really good time to write some reflections of things you've learned from Shivam's section if you haven't already, just so that you've got that memory prompt for the future. Equally, if any of you haven't logged into Menti yet, so that's menti.com, you can use the code at the top of the screen, which is 9903-3638. And by logging into that, you'll be able to take part in little polls we'll be having throughout the session. So I've got a couple of them coming up in this next segment of the presentation. So it's good for you guys to get involved. And we've just reached 3.20. So I am going to start, but I'll start slowly just for anyone who is still coming back. Um, so Shivam, the next section we're going on to now is a bit about being a clinical medical student. So I'm just going to refresh uh, to anyone who wasn't here earlier what it means by being a clinical medical student. So we've just did Shivam's section and that section was all about preclinical, which is when you're spending most of the time at the university, although you might have some small segments of time on placement. So say half a day or a full day a week or less frequently. Whereas clinical medicine is once you're actually fully in the hospitals, maybe with a few sessions back at the university. So essentially the dynamic is flipped. And this is usually the latter half of the medicine degree. Um, that might be from third year, which it was in my case, or it might be from fourth year at other universities. So it's structured slightly differently depending where you go. Um, so most of what I'll be talking about is from my own experience, but I'll also uh, point out to you guys where it might differ at different medical schools schools. Um, and I'm actually going to start off by answering a question from the Instagram that I saw had been submitted, uh, which was, did you ever feel like you weren't good enough or smart enough to become a doctor? And the reason I actually really wanted to start with that one is because that is absolutely how I felt at multiple times throughout the degree. And what I would say is a lot of us here will have this thing called imposter syndrome. And it's the idea that no matter how much you do, you always have a little question in your mind of, am I good enough? Um, really with medical school, it doesn't matter what background you're from. It doesn't matter what your grades were before you entered. So I'm someone who got AAB before medical school. So starting off, I thought I was going to be sort of the bottom academically, really struggling. And actually, I I've ended up getting an academic job, which is a really quite competitive job coming out of medical school. And I think that shows how actually if you're willing to work hard, you're willing to take part in all the opportunities. Ultimately, you will become a doctor once you get into medical school. And um, so absolutely, I think having a little bit of shaking in your self confidence, that's normal. Um, but really, it, as long as you're willing to work hard, anyone can succeed at medical school. Would you agree with that, Shivam? I think, to be honest, Ellie, you're the, the perfect kind of example of that, where you have, uh, do you just want to explain actually, Ellie, a bit about the contextual offer that, that, that you got and, and what, that, what that actually means? Yeah, so the, the state school that I went to uh, was essentially a low performing state school. And I'm from a family where uh, no one in the generation above had been to university. So one of the things that Hull York Medical School, uh, I believe they still offer it, and they certainly offered it when I applied, was the idea that if you're from um, a less well off background, you would get a slightly lower offer 
to enter university. Um, so that's why I was able to get in on an AAB offer, whereas most medicine offers are three A's or above. Um, and that's acknowledging the fact that actually just because you've come from a certain area where the opportunities were less, that doesn't mean you're less likely to succeed at medical school. Um, so I think that is really important to emphasize to anyone here that even if you struggle to this point, actually university is really different and it's more about how willing you are to put in the hard work. Um, so with that, I'm gonna start this next part of the presentation. So a little bit about myself. So as I said earlier, I'm a final year medical student at Hull York Medical School. Um, I came into university straight from school. So that's what I mean when I say I'm a school leaver as opposed to being a graduate, which would mean you've done a degree beforehand. And as I said, I'm a first generation university. So my parents didn't go to university. And up and coming, I'll be joining the Academic Foundation Programme in August, which means I'll be a doctor, but with a special interest. So my special interest is medical education. So I'll be doing that for part of my time. Um, and I just wanted to give that bit of context, just so you know where I'm coming from with this presentation. So clinical medicine, this is where you start to spend a lot more of your time in hospitals, in GP practices. So in this picture, in the background there, that's whole Royal Infirmary. So for me, that's where I've spent a lot of my time on placement. Where you have your placements will vary depending which medical school you're at. So at Hull York, ours are spread across the region. So I've had placements in Hull, York, Scarborough and Grimsby. And also Scunthorpe is another site that HIMSS have their placements at. So that's again, it's worth having a look at what the different medical schools offer, because some of them will have more rural placements, some of them will be city based placements. And it's really nice because you start to see different patients from different areas. So such as when I was based in York and I had my emergency placement, actually, there were a lot of farming injuries coming in um, people who had accidentally um, gotten their hand in the way of a sheep vaccination and be asking what would happen next. Um, so it's actually really nice to start seeing a variety of patients and again, general practice. So for me, that's a rotation in itself in final year, but it depends how your medical school structures it. So it is a much more varied experience compared to the first couple of years of medical school. Okay. So what do I do in an average day on placement? So again, this is really variable. And I think one of the big things about clinical phase of medical school is that it is what you make of it. Because you spent the first couple of years learning a lot of knowledge, and now it's about becoming a doctor and starting to transition towards it. So your responsibilities in third year are far less than they're going to be in fifth year, and it builds gradually over time. Um, so for example, one thing you might do is you might join the ward round. Um, Shivam, what is a ward round? Is that a term that you're aware of? Yeah, of course. So this is um, an aspect that a lot of students might not actually have, have ever come across before. What, what is a ward round? So a ward round basically means um, it, it's, it's an opportunity for doctors, for nurses, mm -hmm. for consultants, uh, for, for the pharmacist, for the physiotherapist to all go around together and see each patient um, at one time and go through, you know, what is the diagnosis? What is the problem with this patient? How are we going to treat this patient? Yeah. Remember, guys, no one person will ever treat a patient. It will always be lots of different doctors or lots of different healthcare professionals working together. So, Ellie, the, the ward round itself, um, mm -hmm. how, how does it work and how do you start to become efficient in the, in the ward round and what do you actually do as, as a kind of clinical medical student there? Yeah good question and um, so it varies quite a lot so with the ward round as you've said Shivam there's a lot of people involved in that you've got the doctors you've got the nurses and you've got whoever else might be involved depending which ward you're on. As a medical student at the very beginning, you might just be observing. So you might just be following around, listening to what's being said, trying to see how much you can understand. What I found most useful was actually having a notepad with me and actually writing down words that I didn't recognize, things that confused me right at the start, because you don't necessarily understand everything that's happening at the beginning. But as you get more confident, you can start getting more involved. And as you said, Shivam, getting more efficient. So, for example, by the time you reach final year, it's a good idea to get there a bit early, have a chat with the doctors before you start and say, do you mind if I write in some of the patient notes for you? And they can teach you how to do that. So then when you go on the ward round, rather than you just watching, you can actually be recording what's going on. 
And then actually, because you're getting more actively involved, you're showing initiative, they might actually ask you to chat with some of the patients, to examine some of the patients. And that's where your learning then really gets a lot more uh, immersive and you actually feel like part of the team, which is something that is quite hard when you first start going into those placements. But it's something that you really do build on over time. So the next bullet point here we've got is attending teaching or clinical skills sessions. So teaching sessions, the same as it will have been in early medical school, you'll likely have some sessions that might be lecture based, it might be small group based, where you're learning about a topic because no one is expecting you to have all of your knowledge for being a doctor from those first two years, you're still going to need to be taught things. So this carries on through years three, four, five, beyond, um, depending on which medical school you're at, depending how it's structured, but you will have some element of teaching. And clinical skills sessions. So one of the great things as you start getting from about midway in the degree onwards is you can start doing clinical skills. And that includes everything from examining patients right up to taking bloods, doing cannulas, doing catheters. So actually, by the time you graduate, you'll know how to do a lot of these minor procedures that F1 doctors, so your first year post graduating, would be able to do. So you start learning those as a student. So the way we do it at Hull York, actually, by the time I graduate, I'll have done at least 40 cases of taking bloods and at least 40 cases of putting cannulas in. That does vary between medical schools, but you start getting more and more experience. And, and Ellie, well, I, I just yeah, had a quick yeah. question there about yeah. clinical skills. So clinical skills you mentioned are about kind of it's kind of getting your hands dirty, isn't it, really? It's 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 a big part of of what a lot of students actually want why, why they actually wanted to go into medicine in the first place you know to do these procedures yeah. so do you just want to kind of summarize does that happen quite early on or, or is that something that you you go through you know in third year fourth year or fifth year yeah so it'll depend a little bit which medical school we're talking about when we say that but for me personally in third year I learned how to take blood um, and then in the latter half of third year I learned to do cannulas in fourth year I learned to do catheters so it gradually builds upon it um, and most medical schools will have some sort of checklist so then when you go on your placements you need to check off doing a certain number of different skills and this is something I had no idea about before starting medical school but it's actually quite exciting it's quite nerve-wracking don't get me wrong when you first start but it is actually feeling like you're doing something useful because you can show up on the ward and say well actually I know how to take blood so then actually the doctors can say okay well we'll supervise you why don't you take the blood on these patients and it just gets you a lot more involved and it gets you actually starting to feel like a doctor for the first time. So then this final point was about clerking patients and independent study so again it's done different ways in different places but we've already described what clerking a patient is like and I'm going to go through an example of that in just a moment and you'll also have time for independent study so I know some of the questions coming through on the Instagram page we're talking about well when do you do your private study so you'll get to do private study in the evenings on the weekends but also you will have factored time during the week in most cases where you can go and do your own studying because again you'll need to learn off of what you've seen in the hospital Hospitals. So, for example, if you're on a respiratory ward, you're seeing people who've got different lung related problems, then it's good to go away with the textbook afterwards and read about those conditions. And I don't know about you, Shivan, but for me, that helps it stick in my brain much more if I've actually seen someone with that condition. Well, I think, Ellie, but to kind of summarise, actually, mm. the, 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 is, is probably a lot of you guys are aware of um, medical students were the first students that were told by kind of the government and universities to actually go back to university as, as, yeah. as soon as possible and the reason for that is because medicine can really only be learned in person you know to meet patients to talk to patients and I think this just stresses Ellie just how important communication is in medicine so if you feel like you you know you you, you can talk to patients talk, talk mm -hmm. to people really if, if you can empathize with people if you feel like you are able to, to to do maybe a bit of public speaking um, yeah. and, and, and you know, communication really Ellie is 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 the biggest aspect of of medicine isn't it and, and that's, that's what you're doing every day you know like you said you're clerking patients so you're communicating with patients you're doing all these clinical skills that requires you to actually be talking to the patient and maybe working in a team as well so we can start to see a theme here Ellie where 
communication, mm-hmm. teamwork, leadership, they all start to be integrating. And, and that's kind of what makes a good medical student, isn't it? Definitely. And these are things you get taught as well. So I think one thing we've slightly neglected to mention so far is that actually communication skills are taught throughout medical school as well. So even if you're someone at the moment, you feel a little bit shy, you're, you're trying to do these experiences, but it's just not quite in your comfort zone. In your first, second, third year and onwards, you will be taught how to ask these kinds of questions, how to actually express certain things if you're not sure, and actually how to get on with patients from different backgrounds or patients who might be angry or upset. These are skills that are tested at your medical school interviews to some extent, but then they are built on at medical school. So don't worry if you don't feel like you're there at the moment, because I certainly wasn't. I was really shy before medical school. But it's something you do learn and you develop over time. Um, And as Shivam said, communication is a huge part of clinical placements. And Ellie, just one final point there. Medical students, uh, sorry, medical schools Mm -hmm. don't want the finished article, do they? When you're applying to medicine, they they don't want you to be the most perfect person in the world. They know that that you're still at sixth form, you're still at college. Of course, you're not going to be at the same level as a third year or fifth year medical student but what they want from you is is they want to see they want to see your enthusiasm they want to see what have you actually done to show an interest in medicine what why 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 should we pick you what skills do you have have you have you maybe um been the captain of a team have you started up a society have you have you started to really take ownership of your learning and ownership of your of your life almost so Remember, a big part of this is medical schools don't want the finished article. They want someone who is going to actually grow. So they want that when they when they pick you and when they select medical students uh, to to, to come to their medical school, they actually are looking for students who are probably not even even anywhere near their full potential, but but will will be growing a lot. And, And I think, Ellie, that's something that you've always kind of mentioned to me that you felt like you. You, you, you weren't very kind of confident when you went to that medical yeah. school interview, but actually you thought that the, the, the interviews actually saw your potential um, exactly. and that, that was a big aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's completely right, Shivam. Nobody is expecting medical school candidates to be at their maximum when they apply but it is about showing that motivation that willingness to learn being able to reflect on your strengths and weaknesses. That's all really important. So yeah, Ellie, do you just want to talk a bit here about the kind of curriculum specific to kind of Hull York? And and, and actually, this is quite similar to most medical schools across the country. So actually, yes, it applies to Hull York, but it's very much the same everywhere else. Exactly, exactly. So these topics might be shuffled around slightly, but the general basis is the same. So this is the kind of curriculum that I've been through over the past three years. So in year three, we did mental health, so psychiatry placements. So that was a mixture of inpatient facilities, which are sometimes attached to hospitals, sometimes they're not. Um, It's a mixture of having more community based placements. So things like um, centres for intellectual disabilities, for example, with kids. So various different sites for mental health cardiorespiratory which is far more hospital based so that's things like the cardiology wards the respiratory wards seeing patients with heart and lung problems gi and surgery so that's just the way that we split it at hull york is we put the gastro tummy problems together with the surgical problems Um, but some medical schools will have surgery as its own block And metabolic, which for us was things like thyroid, kidneys um, and more sort of endocrine conditions that you might be aware of already. Year four, we did emergency paediatrics, which is child health, women's health, which is things like um, gynecology or obstetrics. So pregnant women, neuromuscular and elderly medicine. And then in final year, it's more recapping all of that and bringing in management. So one of the things that you do in your final year of med school is a prescribing exam. So I found out yesterday that I passed my prescribing exam, which means that when I enter F1, I'll be able to prescribe medications. So that's a really important part of final year. So this is just an example curriculum, um, but it's just giving you an idea of the kinds of things you can look forward to during those years of medical school. So we're actually going to go through a case now, and it's absolutely fine if you have no idea what's going on in this case, because that is kind of the point as well. So when you assess a patient, you're going to do three main things. 
you start off by taking a history. So that's, for example, if Shivam came to me with a cough, then I'd start asking him about the cough. I'd say things like, how long have you had it? Do you bring anything up with the cough? Do you have any chest pain? And that would start to give me an idea of what's causing Shivam's cough. Then examination. So that would be where I say, OK, Shivam, well, you've got a cough. So I'm going to have a little feel of your chest, a bit of a listen to try and figure out, could this be pneumonia, for example? And that, again, gives you a bit more information. And then investigations. So that's things like when you do blood tests, when you do x-rays, other sorts of scans, any lung function tests, anything extra you might do. But really, in a lot of cases, you can get the strongest idea from the history alone. So just from asking questions, which brings back that idea that communication is so important. And also, Ellie, remember before yeah. we mentioned that bit about the five W. So we mentioned who, <laughs> what, when, why, where, all these important points. Yeah. So, for example, I've come in with a cough. You can just even think about things like when did it start? Um, yeah maybe maybe things about who so what can I think about with who well who else are you living with so for example yeah. maybe my whole family or my whole household are, are having this cough as well that might be a telltale sign um yeah. where where have you been have you been working in a big kind of coal mine have I been working in mm -hmm. um a place with kind of lots of dust or maybe I've been working with my cat all day so again if, if you're really struggling to think about the history taking, guys, think think about those five W's because I, it gives, gives you a really nice basis. Um, so, yeah, Ellie, do yeah. you just want to talk about this kind of most likely diagnosis with this patient with a shortness of breath? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for this case, so if you all just think to yourselves about what conditions you might be thinking of, and you might just have one or two things in your mind at the moment. But by the time you get to a few years into medical school, you might have a long list of possibilities. So a 27 year old female presents to accident and emergency feeling short of breath. It started two hours ago, while she was at the cinema with her friends. She also has some chest pain that feels like a knife in the right side of her chest. She was previously fit and well, and the only medication that she takes is the contraceptive pill. So I'll just go back through that. So we've got a 27-year-old female coming into A&E. So she's obviously quite worried because she's come to A&E, feeling short of breath. Started two hours ago while at the cinema. There's also a chest pain that's a really stabbing pain in the right side of the chest. She was previously fit and well, and the only medication she takes is the contraceptive pill. So I'm going to bring up a poll now and give everyone a chance to vote for what they think is the most likely condition. Now, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't investigate anything else. We'd probably investigate all three, but it's which one, just based on that short history, do you think is the most likely condition? And I'll just give it just a minute to get those answers coming in. And you can see what other people are thinking as well. But try to go for what you think the answer is. OK, so well done to everyone who's answering so far. So just to read out the possible answers. So the first one was a myocardial infarction, which is uh, just the posh name for a heart attack. The second was an asthma attack. And the third one was a pulmonary embolism or a blood clot in the lung. So Ellie, I just want to stress something here. So you mentioned kind of a posh name. So that, that really is a big part of medicine, actually. There's lots yeah. of different words that just mean it they, they just they just means they mean something very, very simple. So mm -hmm. for example, emesis just means it's basically a posh word for vomiting. Yeah. Um, a myocardial infarction is just another word for heart attack. So doctors absolutely love to use these <laughs> fancy words to sound kind of clever and, and a bit different. So, again, this is something that don't worry at all. Don't worry if you do. I had no idea what my, a, an MI meant, what a myocardial infarction yeah. meant. I had no idea what a pulmonary embolism is. Um, so when I started medical school, I had no idea about what these words meant. But what I did think about is I, I just broke it down I looked on Google okay what is an MI well it means a heart attack well you know I've kind of heard mm -hmm. of that before um but again don't worry about the words in, in too much kind of detail it, it that's something that you absolutely learn at medical school 
Absolutely, absolutely. And it's also something you need to remember, even once you learn these words, when you talk to patients, you're going to have to essentially translate it back again. Because when you're talking to patients, they won't know what you mean if you talk about a myocardial infarction. To a patient, you'd say about a heart attack. So even if you start to understand it, you then got to learn to translate it back again. So I can see the polls starting to come to a bit more of a standstill now. So I'll start going through the answers. And actually, most of you got the correct answer. In this case, the most likely diagnosis would be a pulmonary embolism. Now, the reason I've put those other two answers is because they're not that unreasonable, but there are certain things in the history that would point you towards some answers rather than others. So the most likely diagnosis here would be a blood clot in the lung. So Ellie, actually, if you just go back to that previous slide. Yeah. So some people put um, an asthma attack. So why? Well, uh, to be honest, you know, I was initially leaning towards an asthma yeah. attack because because it's it, you, like you said, I think it happened two hours ago. It, yeah. It's come on really suddenly. Um, so, you know, asthma attack is, you know, fair enough. It, it could potentially it be is, an asthma attack. It is. It's reasonable. Attack. So, so can you tell me then, Ellie, why, why have you chosen not, why have you not chosen the asthma attack there? What, what, why is it yes. unlikely to be that? So, in the history, so if we look back at the case, and we'll just talk through some parts of that case. So, the first thing that I noticed here is that she was previously fit and well. So, if someone's had an asthma attack at age twenty-seven. I would be surprised if they had no history of asthma in the past because they've gotten to age 27 with not even having an inhaler, not having any attacks before. So that makes it a bit less likely, but not impossible. The fact that it's a stabbing pain in the chest means it could potentially be asthma, but that's slightly more indicative of having a blood clot in the lung. So that's some quite specific knowledge. It's slightly more likely to be a pulmonary embolism, but again, it doesn't rule out asthma. As you said, Shivam, shortness of breath coming on quickly does apply to both of those, so that's reasonable. The other thing though, is that she takes the contraceptive pill. So this again is quite unique knowledge. And this comes into one thing that you were saying earlier, Shivam, which is learning pharmacology. So pharmacology is a study of drugs. And actually, what you might learn about the contraceptive pill is it makes blood a bit more likely to clot because of the estrogen contained within the pill. So because of that, because there's no history of asthma, because she takes the contraceptive pill and just the general nature of how it's come on, it's slightly more likely to be a blood clot in the lung. But as you said, Shivam, asthma is not an unreasonable second guess. And we would certainly consider both possibilities here. So that's where actually examining and investigating becomes really important. Yeah, so Ellie, I just want yeah. to stress to everyone, any if you put uh, a myocardial infarction, if you put an mm. asthma attack, you know what, you're actually, you know, it could have been all three of them, really. Um, yeah. If actually, we there was not enough information there. So for example, exactly. Ellie, if, there, if, if it said in, the, um, in that description that the patient was wheezing, or yes. you know you could hear like a wheeze like a whistling sound i think majority of people would have absolutely put the asthma attack exactly um, so yes again just a few words that they, they that weren't kind of put in that description kind of changes what it could be and what it couldn't be so again really well done guys it's it's it was a uh, to be honest ellie it's a pretty harsh um it was one. it was um and it was just to emphasize the kinds of things that you'll learn along the way um so i'll just touch upon heart attack there because i know 66 people did put heart attack so that's quite a lot of people who thought this is reasonable and again we would certainly check it out as a possibility looking back at the case the reasons why heart attack is less likely First of all, just her age. So heart attacks are more common in older people. Not exclusively, it can happen in younger people. But if we're going balance of probabilities, it's less likely in a 27 year old. Other things would be the type of pain. So a stabbing pain tends to be a lung problem more than a heart. Tends to be, not always. Heart problems tend to be more like someone sat on your chest, more like a pressure. That's what you'd expect with a heart attack. And other things that you might hear about here would be someone who has a history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol. They might have had heart attacks in the past. They might have pain into their arm or their jaw. Those are some other things you might look for. 
again, I'm going into far too much detail here. This is not what you need to know at this point. This was purely for interest. And to be honest, you're here because you're interested in medicine. So hopefully some of you found that fun as well going through a case. Um, Ellie, if you, yeah. if you just go back to that again, I just want to stress one thing sure. to everyone, just one last time. So there are two pieces of information that when I read here, I, I just said to myself, hmm, this is maybe not likely to be a heart attack. And I'll tell you which two pieces of information it was. Number one was 27 years old. OK, so like you said, you're 27 having a heart attack. Very unlikely, you know, not you know possible, but highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. uh, if it was an 80 year old female that presented. Mm, now I'm thinking yeah. a bit different. The other bit here, um, Ellie, is the right side of their chest. Now, anyone who mm. kind of read this in, in a bit more detail and looked into it, have a think, where is your heart? Which side is your mm -hmm. heart on? So a lot of you are probably aware of that the heart is on your left-hand side, not on your right-hand side, unless you have something, again, a fancy word, yeah. it's called dextrocardia. So anyone who wants to look that up, it's called mm -hmm. dextrocardia. Dextrocardia just means when actually people are born with the heart, not on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side. Again, very, mm -hmm. very rare. Um, but because she is 27 years old and the pain was in the right hand side, Ellie, I was thinking, mm, well, it's it, it's maybe not to do particularly with the heart. But mm -hmm. um, again, she had some chest pain. So anyone who put a heart attack, absolutely fair enough. You know, it was a yeah. very tricky question. And I think Ellie was being a bit horrible. <laughs> Yeah. And again, it was just to give us lots of things to talk about really in this session and about how even just from starting to have some information, you've got an idea in your mind and all of these things will probably be on your list of possibilities. So as the doctor, when you start asking questions in your head, you form what we call a differential diagnosis, which means a list of different possibilities that this could be. But at the top of the list at the moment, I'm thinking pulmonary embolism, but other people might disagree. So what actually is a pulmonary embolism? Because I keep talking about it. So the idea is that there is a blood clot. This blood clot usually starts in the leg. So for some reason, you've had a buildup of blood forming a clot in the leg. And that's for a lot of different reasons. That could be that you've got a genetic condition where your blood clots a bit more. It could be that you've stayed still for a really long time, like if you've been in hospital, for example. Um, and it could be, uh, for example, other things that make your blood clot, like if you're pregnant. So a blood clot forms usually in the leg, and then a bit of it will break off. And just because of how the blood moves around the body, that can end up in the lung. So it's not an uncommon condition, um, getting a pulmonary embolism, getting a small blood clot in the lung. But what that can cause is what leads to the problem. So because that clot has gotten stuck, so if we look at the picture, it's blocking the flow into that vessel. That then leads to a bit like a heart attack of the lung. So if anyone studied a heart attack where the blood stops getting to part of the tissue, it's a bit like that, but for the lung, because the blood's not getting through anymore. So as I said, there's lots of causes, lots of risk factors, but essentially it's a blood clot in the lung. And that's why you get the chest pain. And that's why you get the shortness of breath that comes with it as well. Um, so I'm not gonna go into any more depth than that because that's just for general interest. Um, and some of you might have heard of this condition before if you've had friends or family with this kind of condition. Ellie, if you just go back to that slide again. So yeah. I, I just wanna stress one thing to everyone. And I think mm. you've really mentioned this is actually just breaking down what the words always mean. So mm -hmm. pulmonary means lungs you know it's it, pulmonary mm -hmm. basically is another word for lungs it's part of the lung system mm -hmm. embolism means a clot so just to make this very very clear pulmonary embolism is a clot in the lungs and it's in the name pulmonary lungs and embolism clot now like ellie said you could get this clot in any part of your body and it can come up in into into the um into the lungs and then lodge in your lungs yeah. So that's why, Ellie, I would, you know, this is um, kind of tips for everyone here. If mm. anyone's ever going on a plane with uh, maybe an elderly relative who's, for example, your grandma, your granddad, maybe even your parents as well, you should, and again, this, this is applies to all of you, you should always get up and about when you're on a plane, especially if it's a long journey. And the reason for that, particularly if you're old, is that if you're sat down for, let's say, six, seven, eight hours on this plane and you haven't even moved, that blood is starting to kind of stagnate in your legs it's starting to just stay mm. in your legs and that is giving a, a lovely opportunity for the blood to actually clot 
and suddenly clot in your legs. And that could potentially then, Ellie, like you said, that clot could then move up into your body, come up here and then go into your lungs. So it might go into your heart. Again, remember the atria and the ventricles. Again, I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail, <laughs> but, but again, just break things down. So Ellie yeah. has mentioned a pulmonary embolism just means a clot in the lungs. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Shivam. Okay, so we've asked some limited information. And as Shivam said, there really wasn't very much information that I gave you all there. So well done, everyone, for having a go with that poll, because actually we didn't have enough information. So then we might start to think, well, what else would I have liked to have known in the ideal world? And we won't go through everything by any means, but we might want to know a bit more about what they've come in with. So we might want to know a bit more about this stabbing pain that they had. Does it travel anywhere else? Um, how severe is that pain? Is it just a bit uncomfortable or is it really severe? We might want to ask about how are they in general? Are they otherwise fit and well or do they have a fever? Because if they had a fever, that might send us in a different direction. So we want to find out a bit more about how they are now might want to know a bit more about her medical history so we know she's otherwise fit and well but that doesn't mean that actually she's never had any medical problems before so we might just ask her a bit more about have you ever been in hospital um again medications is there anything else that she's taking that she's not told us about so you can ask a bit more about that about family history so having blood clots in the lungs is something that's more likely to run in families doesn't always but if she said oh actually my mum has had this condition then in your head you might go right that makes it a bit more likely and you might move it up your list of possibilities social history so who does she live with at home does she smoke does she drink alcohol other information that again makes some conditions more or less likely than others and then you might ask some more specialized questions. Um, so one thing that we were saying, for example, with the cough earlier, and do you live with people? So actually, have they traveled abroad? Have they been exposed to TB? Have they been exposed to asbestos? So don't worry if you don't recognize all these words, you might recognize some of them, you might know some of those conditions, um, but you might ask more specific questions once you know about the conditions. So once you start your clinical placement in third year, you might get, say, 60% of the questions when you're talking with someone. You might remember about 60% of what you want to ask. But then by fifth year, you remember all the questions and you'll be able to ask in a lot more depth about the conditions. And that's what really helps get you prepared then for being a doctor and having to make the decisions. So actually, Ellie, there, what I say, for example, yeah. I'm one of the students listening in today, um, mm -hmm. the last kind of bit that you've talked about in terms of reflection and actually writing something down I've learned kind of two things from there one of the things is that medicine doesn't seem to be black and white does it there no. you know things things start to overlap you know it, it could it could have been an asthma attack it could have been a, a, a heart attack um, mm -hmm. so again th this is quite important you know there's quite a lot of gray areas to medicine and that's what makes again this kind of links to my second point which is being a doctor is almost like being a detective isn't it, it it's it's very much about you know asking questions asking questions to yourself and starting to realize how can I piece all these bits together we pieced a lot yeah. of information there didn't we Ellie we pieced together 27 years old we pieced together she's on the contraceptive pill we pieced mm -hmm. together it happened two hours ago mm -hmm. um, you know, lots of things that we actually when you start piecing together we realize okay actually it's probably more likely to be that pulmonary embolism that you mentioned Absolutely, absolutely. And yes, yeah, so as you said, Shivam, it's not black and white. Medicine is very much a grey skill. So two people can approach the same situation and come to slightly different answers. But being a safe doctor means that you still check out everything else. So that leads on to what I was going to say next, which is what would happen next? So in real life, what would we do in this situation? And there's a few different things that would happen in this situation. So we might want to do uh, an examination. So for example, if I listen to this lady's chest and there was a wheeze, as you were saying before Shivam, then I go, actually, I know I was thinking pulmonary embolism, but the wheeze is suggesting asthma. So I might change my mind. And that's absolutely fine. So you might do some blood tests and some bits and pieces, you might do a chest x ray. And ultimately, you would come to your final diagnosis. And then you would think about treatments as well. So how unwell is she? Do I need to treat her immediately? 
or can I do all my investigations and then treat her? And these are all things that you start to get more familiar with the more patients you see. So the really good thing about clinical placements is you see lots of people and you get used to this kind of process. So my next poll is just a really broad question and there's no right or wrong answer. This is just for interest and to check you're all still paying attention. So what skill are you most looking forward to learning? Is it taking blood? Is it learning how to read x-rays? Is it learning how to do suturing? Because these are all things that you will learn how to do while you're at medical school. So actually, so, Ellie, yeah. last, last week we just started like you said about a few of those clinical skills and one of those mm. clinical skills that we just learned was taking blood um, mm -hmm. and initially you know you don't you're not taking blood from anyone at all you're actually doing it on on a, on a mannequin aren't you you're doing it on like a fake arm like a plastic arm and you're taking blood from that arm and then you know you start doing it 10 times 20 times 30 mm -hmm. times and then when you feel very very confident you actually start to think okay I think I'm ready now to do it on maybe uh, my first patient or maybe do it on one of my colleagues and take some blood and again Ellie there's, there's a continuous theme here which is it's practice practice makes it perfect is. and also at the beginning when I first took some blood from a, a, a dummy arm you know even that was quite scary for me and I, and I didn't feel very confident even though I knew it wasn't on a real person so it's okay to feel out of your depth it's okay to feel like you don't know much and you and you know we don't know everything, you know, Ellie, mm -hmm. I, you, you're going to be a doctor very, very soon. And, you know, I'm sure there's gaps in your knowledge and I'm sure there's things that you feel very, very confident with, but then mm -hmm. things that you might not feel as confident with, but that's yeah. fine, isn't it? And so, so why is that fine, Ellie? What, why is it okay to not feel confident in certain things? So it's fine because medicine is just so huge. It's not possible for everyone to know everything. And ultimately you're part of a team. So when I start working in August, it's very unlikely I would ever be on my own. And if I am, someone is only a phone call away. So if I was ever in a situation where I felt uncomfortable with what I was doing, I wasn't sure what to do next. There's always someone I could get in touch with. Um, and medicine does change over time. So even if I learn everything right now, in a few months, I wouldn't know everything anymore because more things have happened. So it's OK as long as you're willing to keep learning and call for help when you need it. Um, and that's actually a really important thing to take away from this is awareness of your limitations that's a really important part of medicine in general so I'll move on from this slide and um, but this was just generally out of interest and it seems like most of you are actually looking forward to doing suturing um, so that's really exciting and actually that's something that um, if you're very lucky as a medical student you might be asked to for example in theatre to close a wound for example uh, you'd be under a lot of supervision when you do that you'd be taught how to do it first of all um, but suturing is definitely one exciting skill that you can learn. So um, I was going to do some frequently asked questions here as well. Um, so the first question that I was going to answer here is what are clinical exams like? Because I'm sure some people here are wondering how you actually get assessed in this kind of thing. So in the first couple of years of medical school, pretty much all your exams, uh, depending where you go, will be sit down exams a bit like GCSE and A-levels, either multiple choice, short answer questions, maybe essays, depending where you go. Once you start getting around halfway through the degree, you get more and more clinical exams in addition to those. So your knowledge is still tested with those kinds of exams, but you'll get exams where actually you have an examiner watching you ask questions to a patient, examine them, and then talk about what to do next. So I'll use an example. So I recently had my final year exams. So for my final year exams, we had 15 minutes where we would go into a room and you have to take a history and examine the patient in front of you. Unfortunately, this year, those were all actors because of COVID, but usually it'd be an actual patient. Once you've done that, you then leave the room, have a think about what you've seen, and then you go back in and have 15 minutes chatting to the examiner about what you thought the condition was, talking about the condition, talking about what you would do next. So that's how clinical exams are generally done, although obviously the timings, the situations when you do them will vary on medical schools, but broadly it's quite a similar premise uh, regardless of where you go. So yeah, Ellie, do you just want to clarify that one more time? So a clinical yeah. exam... What actually is it? How do you actually get assessed? 
Yeah, so you're essentially assessed on how you interact with a patient, the types of questions you ask, and can you figure out what's going on with them? And you don't have to always get exactly the right answer. So if you took a history like the one of that shortness of breath, and you said, I think it's asthma, that doesn't matter because you'll be asked, OK, could it be anything else? And what would you do next? And it's all about showing that you can interact with a patient and that you'd be a safe doctor. So that's quite different to these written exams that you might be used to, because it's all about how you express yourself, how you talk to a patient in a clinical setting. So that's what a clinical exam would be. The next question I think we've actually covered, which is when do you learn to take blood? It'll depend on your medical school, usually around year three or four. Um, you'd start off on dummies and then progress up to patients is generally how it works. Do you have to do night shifts? So this was something that I always wondered. Um, again, it depends on your medical school, but most medical schools will have a couple of night shifts that you can practice. Some will have more than that and some will have just a couple. So for me this year, in my final year, we had to do three night shifts across the year. Um, and they usually put those in a block so that you can get used to it. And the reason they do that is because then you get to see how the hospital works at night and you get to get used to what it's like to try and switch your sleep pattern. Because for those of you here today who's never had a job who works at night, for example, you might not be used to actually what a night shift looks like. Um, so you might get some experience of night shifts depending where you go. And the final one, how difficult is it? Uh, which I think is the classic question a lot of people do wonder about is how hard is that part of medical school? I'd say it's quite different to a lot of courses in that it's very practical. You're very, uh, you're very much exposed when you're on the wards. You need to be quite forthcoming. You need to really look for opportunities. But ultimately, I don't think it's any harder than any other course, because every course has its pros, its cons, its strengths, its weaknesses. Um, I think, as Shivan was saying back in his section, it's about how you organise. So if you're someone who is willing to organise and say, I'm going to work for X number of hours in the evening, X number on the weekends, I'm going to take this time for myself, then actually it becomes a lot easier. Um, so there's no straightforward answer to that. But I know it's something that a lot of people do wonder about. And Ellie, just just to kind yeah. of clarify, I think I think with the difficulty, it's um, the kind of clinical phases of medical school are very, very different from any other degree. It's it's yeah, it's very unique because you're not you're not reading books all day. You're not on your computer all day. You're not writing essays. You're actually doing things in person. It's very, very practical. So if you like visual learning, if you like, you know, getting your hands dirty, you like doing things with your hands, you like, um, you know, communicating with patients, you have kind of good mm. manual dexterity, you know, actually, this is like, this is the best time of your life, really, you're really enjoying and starting to kind of thrive yeah. in, in situations like that. But, you know, we've, we've mentioned this before, haven't we, Ellie, you know, going to university is always going to be challenging, studying any degree, mm. you know, if you're studying any degree it is going to be challenging, but actually, um, medical schools make it easier for you because they have these other societies, particularly yeah. the, the medical society. So for example, you could play medics football, um, you could play a medics kind of sport, which which might be on a day which is not very, you know, it might be on, for example, a Saturday when, you know, you know you're not going to have anything in person, you know you're not going to have any teaching. So um, that kind of sums it up, Ellie, doesn't it? I think balance is yeah, key. Um, absolutely. Diff difficulty, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, Ellie, you are going to be Dr. Ellie, you know, you, 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 you're going, your name is basically going to change. You're going to be a doctor. If that was easy, everyone in the whole world would do it, wouldn't they? So I think it, that, that difficulty question is quite a broad question, isn't it? Because, yeah. it, you know, there are going to be challenges, but at the end of the day, if you can balance your time, um, you know, thousands and thousands of doctors are graduating from medical school each year. So, you know, ju just like thousands of uh, students graduate from their sixth form. So, you know, it, it, they've, they're doing something well, they're doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think just my very last slide is going to expand on what you were just saying, Shivam, about the extra opportunities. Um, so I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on this because I know everyone's going to be dying for a break at this point and we will have a break after this slide. 
Um, so this is just a bit about the beyond medicine, because Shivam, you've talked a lot about sport there, but it's not just about sport. So I wanted to talk about some of the other things that people can get involved in at medical school and some of the things that I've been involved in. So one is charity work. So actually, there are a lot of charities that are linked with medical schools in different ways. So the one I'm involved in is Students for Kids International Projects. So I've been in that charity since my first year of medical school. Last year, I was national coordinator for the charity. And this year, I'm their fundraising coordinator. And it's a way that you can actually explore skills other than just treating patients, because you get to learn about uh, things like publicity, you get to learn about um, organizing projects. So for this particular charity, we run projects abroad. So you learn about sustainable development, which is something that isn't really covered in a medicine degree. So there's definitely scope to do work with charities. And there's lots of examples of that if you look on medical school websites. Next one is leadership opportunities. So a classic question you might get in an interview is, um, what other things does a doctor do other than just treat patients? And one of those is leadership. And you can take leadership opportunities even as a student. So you could say, be a representative with the British Medical Association as a medical student. One of the things that I've done is I've joined something called the Healthcare Leadership Academy, which means I can uh, get involved in a project. I'm personally running webinars on women in healthcare leadership. So that's another area you can get involved in if you're interested in leadership and academic opportunities. So I mentioned before that I'm going to go down a medical education route, so doing more teaching. And also Shivan talked about uh, evidence based medicine. So you can go into a research aspect. So there's lots of other things you can do. And we don't have time really to go into them now. But it's just to let you know that beyond actually the medical school side of things, there's a whole lot more out there that you can have a look at too. So that's the end of this portion of the presentation. And Shivam, I'll just hand over to you just before the break. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much, Ellie. That was really, really useful. And also going through that case, actually mm. that, that, that case actually just really summarizes what, what being a clinical medical student is all about, really. You, you have someone maybe coming into A&E, you have mm -hmm. no idea what they have and do you know what Ellie they are not going to say to you um Ellie I think I might have a pulmonary embolism or a myocardial <laughs> infarction they're going to say actually I, I have a really tight chest or I have a stabbing pain and actually this is where communication is coming in again because mm -hmm. not only do we need to know the fancy words but we need to talk about those fancy words to patients so for example yeah. um hypertension if I say okay um Mr Smith you actually have something called hypertension they haven't they might not have no idea what that means you know you need mm -hmm. to explain what it means it, you need to explain that actually this is where you have high blood pressure and the pressure in your blood vessels so those vessels traveling yeah. all around your body are starting to to really be under so much pressure that it's going to cause damage to other parts of your body so it's about explaining things simply and I think Ellie that's why well that's why you you enjoy teaching don't you because yeah um, definitely we, we love we love simplifying things and um, that, that kind of summarizes, you know, whether, you, whether you're studying GCSEs right now or, or you're studying A-levels, try to break things down, try to make things easier to, for yourself. If you feel a bit overwhelmed with the work that you have, take mm -hmm. a step back and, and, and ask yourself, how can you break that down? Um, so what we're going yeah. to do, Ellie, is just have a break now. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to have this break for, I'm just checking, for about 15 minutes or so. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll be back at... We'll just At 25 past yeah so can i was just gonna go through the timing so can i do you just want to let us know what when should the students be coming back yeah, so um, if you guys come back at, let's say, 4.25, then Moha will start then. Um, and we haven't got too much longer left. I know it's a long afternoon for all of you guys, but we have Moha coming up. And then after that, we have Nishma, who is a GP registrar who's done lots of work in the NHS for management. And she's a really exciting speaker is coming. Um, alongside Mo, who was one of the founders of Medic Mind, um, and he's working as a foundation doctor. So Shivam and Ellie have given you a really good insight into the steps leading up to finishing medical school. And hopefully this next segment is on life as an actual doctor. And around 5.30, we'll be giving everyone um, actual um, proof of coming to this event. So we'll sort out a form to give you proper um things for that so stick around for around 5 30 when we can give you that um, at the end of the work experience event 
Okay, so um, as I mentioned before for the last break, please don't leave the call. Uh, just maybe just meet your camera or just meet yourself and come back um, in 13 minutes time or 4.25. But thank you so much to Shivam and Ellie for an amazing start to the first half of the day. Perfect. So just to kind of confirm everyone, it's 4.25. Um, and yeah, just get a snack, just maybe drink some water, go to the toilet and we'll be back very soon. Um, again, please, please, please just do a bit of reflection. Think about what have you actually learned? Like, just ask yourself, what have you actually learned over the last few hours? Write it on a piece of paper, talk to your parents, talk to someone about it. What have you, what have you actually got from the last few hours? Um, and, and that will really help you in terms of kind of your memory and just learn just, just in terms of, kind of getting the most out of today. Um, so we'll see everyone very, very soon. So just to confirm that is 4.25. Um, and yeah, see you guys in a bit.
Um, hey guys, for anyone who's still around at the moment, um, if you want to submit any questions to me on Instagram, um, so if you just go to the Instagram story with my face on it, and then just submit any questions, and then I'll answer them throughout the um, section. So yeah, don't worry, we'll start in about four minutes or so. Okay, guys, so um, welcome back after that very, very short break. Um, and in the first half, we had Shivam and Ellie going through life as a medical student in different parts, both preclinical and clinical. Um, and in the afternoon or in, these last, in this last hour or so, we have Mohul um, and also Nishma, who are both doctors at very different stages of their career. So Mohu is an F1 doctor, which is essentially what you go into straight after medical school. And quite often that's the scariest part of medicine, people say. When you kind of go from being a student and being taught everything and comforted all the time to going straight into being a doctor where you have high pressure and you have nurses giving you lots of different tasks every minute. And then we have Nishma later on, who's been a doctor for many years before. She's worked in the NHS 
in healthcare leadership, in management, in lots of different roles. And she'll show you a more experienced insight into the NHS. So I'll hand over to Mohul now. And we also have Shivam, who will be around for the whole afternoon, um, just contributing where he can. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot, Kanal. So yeah, as, as Kanal mentioned, so uh, my name is Mohul. I'm a current FY1 doctor. I'm now explaining kind of what that means. Um, so I've just finished medical school about eight months ago and now working as a full-time doctor. Um, so I want to keep this uh, part of the session really interactive. So any questions that you have, you know, head over to Instagram and ask me. Um, so there's already a few questions that have come in. Um, and the first thing I want to say about being a doctor, I think it can be very overwhelming. You hear lots of scary stories in the news. But the most important thing to remember is that you're not you have a great support um, network around you. Um, and whilst there are times where, for example, you may feel that you're overwhelmed, there's always support out there. If you want to talk to a friend, if you need time off work, there are lots of opportunities available. So the most important thing I would say is that I know it can be scary, especially in the new seeing, you know, all, all the stories about people being overworked, etc. But the most important thing right now that you need to think about is that. Um, once you get through medical school and once you do become a doctor, you just have to enjoy it. And I think having that all the experience that you gain throughout medical school, it all applies um, when it comes to actually starting and becoming a doctor. Um, so, yeah. So I'll now go on to the next slide. Perfect. So um, at this point, oh, OK. Uh, so I think we've got a question here. Um, so just a bit about um, what it's like. So which of these things would you think an FY1, so first year doctor, what, what would they not commonly do? So um, only one thing is something that we wouldn't do and everything else is something that we would do. Okay, so remember just to head over to menti.com um, and use that code just to enter. So let's see what people have put. So fantastic. So we've got quite a, a range of different things that um, people think that a first year doctor would do and things that they wouldn't. Well, the actual correct answer is that the only thing that we wouldn't do is this thing on the left where we wouldn't prescribe certain medications. Actually, you do perform CPR very commonly. In fact, medical students also commonly perform CPR when they come to um, cardiac arrest, for example, when a patient's heart has stopped beating. Speaking to relatives, this is probably the, the most common thing that I do every day. Um, speaking to relatives, giving them an update on how their family is doing. And I think at this particular point in time, it's very important because if you imagine, for example, having a relative in hospital, not being able to see them, not being able to actually visualize what's going on, it can be overwhelming and it can be difficult to, to be basically be that bridge in between the patient's family and the actual patient. So speaking to relatives is, is, is something that we do you know, day in, day out. Confirming the death of a patient. So this is something that FY1s do come routinely. Um, so it can be quite distressing at the first time you do it um, because of course you have to maintain patient's dignity. Um, so that is something that, you know, you, you, you get training on at medical school. Um, seeing unwell patients alone. So I put this there because as a caveat, so technically you, you don't normally see patients unwell alone. You normally supervise, there's normally someone with you. But for example, your registrar, um, may be, may be in, on the wards or in the theatre and you, you may be by yourself. So you may have to initially um, see that patient alone and then you can get support. But as I say, the only, we, we do prescribe, the only things that we can't prescribe are certain medications. So these will be, for example, for chemotherapy um, or certain medications for things like rheumatoid arthritis. And the reason for this is because they're much more specialists. But the main thing that I'm trying to get at from this question is that actually there's a lot of different things you do. You go from, you know, one day being just a student and the next day you're, you're jump, you're thrown into the deep end, you're doing all of these things. Um, and I remember my first week or so, I was kind of like, wow, like I, I didn't expect it to be so fast paced. At, at university, at school, you know, so there's someone there to hold your hand or, you know, guide you. But as soon as you're there, you you really do have to take initiative and, and start picking up things. And I think when I first started, of course, there's a great support network, but you do really have to be switched on. Um, so, yeah. So that's in Mono, terms of... Is there, is there anything that you would actually recommend to kind of medical students in terms of transitioning to become a FY1? So is there, is there anything that they could have been doing or could have done to actually kind of let that transition be a bit easier? 
Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, Shivan. So I say the first thing, the best thing you can do, you know, when you do end up coming to medical school is to shadow doctors, you know, go to your placements, shadow the FY1s. I think people, even on work experience or medical school, you always want to be with the most senior doctor, which is a consultant. But actually, it's better to actually stick around with the more junior doctors because they're the ones that you, that's the role that you're going to be having in a few, in a few years. So that's why I'd say definitely, you know, shadow those junior doctors because they have a, a wealth of experience to gain from. Um, and, you know, just really getting stuck in. So Shivan, for example, when you go on placement, you might you might just be around and hopefully if you have a good doctor, they'll give you um, lots of different things to like taking bloods, etc. And um, so I definitely say getting stuck in is, is the, be- the most important thing. Um, so, yeah, as I said about me, so I mentioned- oh, just mentioned one thing um, as someone who's one year behind Mohill. I, I like I was stressed about I was stressed out about doing most of those things on the list. So I think learning from experience is a big thing because when you're a medical student you probably haven't done most of those things or you've just seen it but I think in your first year you probably learn so much on the job which is scary because yeah you're trying to save lives so you shouldn't really learn on the job but I think like Moho you probably learn so much in one year that you didn't know when you first started right yeah definitely so I think I think at any stage for example year 12 year 13 even medical school each year you're learning so much and when I first started, as Kanal mentioned, there, there are lots of things I, I 100% didn't know. And a lot of the things can be just logistical things, working out how a hospital works, working out, for example, when a patient um, is no longer unwell, why are they still in hospital? Um, and I'll come on and talk about that. So there's lots of different aspects which you'll pick up. So, you know, today what I want to do is just give you a very quick overview. I, I really wish that you guys could have real live work experience where you could shadow doctors. But hopefully today I'm going to, you know, give you that same experience that you would in real life so that's a bit about me um, so I'm currently on my geriatrics placement so this is generally caring for patients who are over 65 um, so the elderly population in the UK we have an aging population so it makes up quite a large proportion of our patients um, so that's what I'm on at the moment I've done respiratory and I'm going to go on to surgery next so just in terms of a timeline so I'm at this stage so I've just finished medical school so as L, for example she she'll now be an FY1 once she finishes so for two years, you're, you're this foundation doctor. And the main thing that you're doing as a foundation doctor is you're gaining experience in lo- lots of different specialties. So for example, you'll gain um, experience into surgery. You'll gain experience into something like GP, community. And it's all about getting these different skills. So for example, even if you want to be a surgeon at the end of the day, you still need certain medical skills. You, 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 you need to be able to you know, interpret imaging like chest x-rays, et cetera. So the aim of this FY1, FY2 period is to give you these skills and to to really equip you that no matter what degree whether you become a GP whether you become a surgeon or even for example ophthalmology you'll have these basic skills which which come in handy Um, and essentially every doctor in the UK has to do F1 and F2 Um, and once you finish those two years so essentially after FY1 um, you then before FY1 sorry you're not you're something called a provisionally registered doctor so what that means is that you're allowed to practice, but for the first year, you're technically not a fully, fully registered doctor on the on the general medical council. So there are certain responsibilities that you can't do, as I mentioned earlier. Once you finish your first year of FY1, um, then you become a registered doctor, you get this full registration, and then you're able to basically go on to F2. And after F2, um, you basically have training. So let's say, for example, you wanted to become a doctor in the hospital, um, you'll go down this pathway of, of core training. And that's essentially the bit in between. So just to keep things simple, I'd say you're an FY1, F2, then you're a middle grade doctor, and then you're the most senior doctor, the consultant. And in this middle grade period, there's lots of acronyms, etc. I'm not going to get into those now. But all you really need to know is that They'll have, you'll have the most junior doctors. There'll be a very, very, very long period in the middle where you're training to become the most senior, which is a consultant. Um, Shivam, what, what's what, what? Have you uh, been with lots of different um, doctors of different grades? What's what's your experience been like? Yeah, it's a really good question. So sometimes it's you don't you don't even know who who is who. Sometimes, mm. like so, for example, re- some of the most senior consultants might. Uh, be the same age as, as as some of the maybe the junior doctors for example so actually um that's one thing that i started to realize is that when you start working in a team sometimes it doesn't really matter you know what what level you're at you know it's it's about the the the, the knowledge that they're providing for you so um a question that's kind of 
come up in in some of the Instagram um, uh, questions is um, yes, you know, um, a core training takes quite a long time, doesn't it? You know, to become a very yeah. senior consultant, but actually um that's that's similar to to jobs for example being a lawyer or being an accountant mm. that takes a lot of time doesn't it any any field like that that you're going into requires a lot of training doesn't it do you just want to talk a bit more about that yeah definitely so i think as i say when you when you think of medicine and you think of that really long time to become a consultant um it can be quite overwhelming you might think oh gosh i may as well just you know pick something quick where i can earn lots of money but as shivam said in, in any degree there or any career you go to there will always be lots of hurdles lots of you know steps of a ladder that you have to climb until you get to the very top um, and i think the good thing about being a doctor is that there's lots of flexibility so for example if you wanted to take a year out or so you are able to at certain stages which you may not be able to do in in other degrees so i'd say don't be put off by the fact that it is a long time until you get to the very top because in my experience, that there's a reason for that. You know, the consultant is the most senior doctor of the hospital. And to actually get to that level, you do need a level of experience. And I think if, for example, next year I became a consultant, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't have the most, um, the, the faintest idea on what the most senior decision should be on, on, on patients. So I think, you know, it's structured that way for a reason and it's, it's, it's worked well. So, yeah. So just coming on to that, Shivam, how long... Oh, okay, fine. Well, we've got we've we've got a poll here. How how many years on average does it take to become a consultant? Um, I'm not sure if it will let you anymore. Um, but yeah, if I think yeah, I think it's changing. So I'll give people some time. So Shivan, what w- what would you say in your experience it it takes? Well, uh, this is the thing. So uh, a question that keeps on coming up is is actually. Yeah. Um, what if you don't know what specialty you want to get into like can, can you just give you know loads of people have been asking you know I, I have no idea I have no idea like kind of what specialty I'm thinking about um, what, what's your advice there sure so for example I still don't fully know what I want to do in terms of my which which specialty I want to focus on so even it, honestly don't worry about it at this stage um, at medical school you know you're, you're exposed to so many different specialties that you get more of an idea and the whole point of FY1 FY2 is to broaden that idea but it's very very early to know what you want to do at this stage and you can always change your mind so for example let's say I at this stage want to work in GP and become a GP and then I go down the GP training pathway I you know finish that I can then actually change my mind I think actually I want to do A&E and I don't have to start the training all the way from the beginning because I can use some of the experience I've gained and vice versa so for example if I want to work in hospital and then I change my mind actually I want to do GP instead of doing the full length of the training program, you can often cut the the time that you do. So you can always change your mind. It's perfectly natural um, to do so because it's very hard to know which specialty you like and people's interests change all the time. Um, That's the first thing I'd say. And the second thing is that when you're a doctor, you can do lots of different things. So if you're a GP, so at some of your GP practices, that some of the GPs might, you know, also do things like steroid injections for your grandparents, or they might do, for example, Um, dermatology thing so you can also have a special interest as well in in lots of different parts of medicine so I wouldn't worry too much about that and yeah so in terms of how many years on average it takes it is 10 years roughly it can take longer if you change specialties it can take quicker if you go down um, certain pathways but yeah on average it's 10 years so if you just bear that in mind that there's so many years of training that you'll do before you get to that stage but there is a reason you're gaining experience year on year 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 on year and also, Moho, I just want to stress one final thing here, just so that everyone is aware of this. Um, that question that you asked, if you just go back to the other slide, yeah, is, sure. it's basically like asking how many years on average does it be- does it take to become the CEO of a company or a senior mm. manager of a company? Now, Moho, we all know that, you know, if you are, you know, this is talking generally about any type of job, you, you, you don't get to the most senior level just like that, do you? It doesn't take, no, of course um, it doesn't yeah. take one or two years. So I think this is actually, this kind of summarizes it really, you know, it's all about the experience. It's all about learning so much and, you know, getting to the top and being a consultant, you know, you can't, you can't get more than a consultant, can you? Exactly. So, um, once you once you are there you're there for life if that makes sense so exactly it's, it's it's actually you know when you think about it compared with becoming for example the CEO of a manager of a company actually mm. you know relatively we're now thinking about actually the, the timeline does make sense doesn't it yeah yeah exactly so now I'll just talk through kind of what I do on a day-to-day basis um so for example 
many of you are asking about do I have what are the hours like so I'm just checking on Instagram um, how many hours do I work per week so it does vary I'd say on average it's about 40 to 50 hours a week um, that I work there'll normally be the general nine to five which is my main job so you have a main job which you do as I mentioned I'm on geriatrics and on top of that main job you also do something called on calls and this is essentially out of hours work so for example on certain days of the week I instead of working nine to five I'll work from 9 to 5 and also from 5 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Um, there'll be certain days where I'll work on the weekend um, rather than working on the weekday. So this is just talking about the day-to-day, the 9 to 5 aspect. And it's generally, it's it's quite it's quite like an office job generally the, in terms of being a junior doctor. For, you know, from the morning, you do something called a ward round where you go around with the consultant, the most senior doctor on the ward, and you basically see each patient. And Shivan, what sort of things do you think we do when we when we see these patients? What what are we trying to achieve by by seeing these patients every day? Yeah, so we we kind of talked about this with Ellie before with regard to what the ward round is. But I think the main thing here is actually understanding what what why is this patient coming to hospital and what can we do exactly. to actually treat them. So that's why we said before that that big team that we have. The reason why we have that big team is, is so that everyone can contribute. And actually exactly. talk about how, how we can treat them in the best way. Exactly. So yeah, as Shivam said, so we'll, we'll 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 try and work out why is the patient coming to hospital? What can we do to to help them? And you know, patients will end up being in hospital for a long period of time, and that can be for a multitude of reasons. So, in, in the morning consultant ward round, what we're trying to do is see is a patient improving? If they have an infection, is their infection improving? If they, for example, have broken their limb, is that limb you know recovering? So it's, it's just working out where is that patient at the stage of, 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 of being discharged from hospital. So that's what we do in the morning. And in terms of what I would do, for example, I would um, look at the blood results. I get the blood results ready for the consultant, just so they can, for example, look at trends of, of patients to see how they're doing. Um, I would, for example, write in the notes whilst the consultant is speaking to the patient or vice versa. So, for example, the consultant might want to write in the notes and, and I'll actually examine the patient. So. There's lots of variety of different things that you do, and it can often feel a bit, a bit like an office job. You're doing the same thing every day, but actually, the, the the job itself can be very repetitive. But the patients aren't. The patients are the things that change. You might get one patient, for example, with with one condition, and a different patient with the same condition but presenting in a very different way. And patients, you know, they, they have a wealth of knowledge that you can gain just by speaking to them. So that's why I'd say in the in the morning and this board round. So. What, what Shivan was touching on is that at 12 p.m., once we've done that ward round, we then go to the board of patients where there's a list of all the patients and we go through them each one by one. Now, here, it's not just the doctors, but it's also the nurses, the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, the healthcare assistants, the pharmacists. We all gather together and we go through each of the patients. And the reason why that's so important is because, for example, what do doctors do? Doctors look at the medical issues of the, of the patient. So we deal with, for example, infection, et cetera. But there's so many other aspects that people need to get fixed before they go home. So, for example, if you've got you know, a frail old lady, is she, even if her infection's cleared, is she going to, are we just going to push her straight into back to her nursing home? What occupational therapists will look at, actually, do we need to make any adjustments? Do we need to insert toilet rails or stairs? Um, so that actually when she gets back home, she doesn't fall over again. Physiotherapists, w- what they do is, for example, if the patient's been in bed all day, we want, and before they were actually walking and active, we want to get them back to that baseline. So this board round is all about optimizing the patient's care from a multidisciplinary point of view. Um, so that's what f- physiotherapists will do. Then we have the nurses who, for example, will actually say, oh, doctor's patient, they're, they're, they're not themselves. Um, so, you know, nurses know patients very well. So that's what they'll do. And then you have the pharmacists who, for example, deal with patients when they're going home, making sure they have the right medications and making sure there aren't area, any errors there. So that's what we, do, what we do at the board round. Then we have lunch, which is obviously the most important part of the day. Um, and then following from that, we then do our jobs. Now, what do I mean by jobs? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that. But essentially what it is, is once we've done that ward round, we've done that board round, the, there'll be lots of lists of tasks that essentially us as junior doctors need to do in the afternoon to help optimize that patient's care. Now I'll just go on to the next slide now where actually I'll talk about some of these jobs. So 
A lot of it can be paperwork. So if a patient's going home, I'll have to write up a document just detailing their journey from when they first came into hospital to the end. There might be procedures that need to be done. So for example, if a patient is having medications via a vein, we may, may need to insert a cannula. They may need a catheter to help drain their urine. They may need also other tests as well, such as blood gases. I may need to liaise with other departments. So if a patient needs an X-ray of the, of the chest, a chest X-ray, I might need to call them. And also nurses might mention, actually, doctor, this, this, I've, I've got a query for you. I've, I've, I've actually got something for you I'd like you to do. So that's the sort of thing that we get. And you guys, as I'm going to put you guys into the hot seat now and make you guys FY1s. So you've got a nurse and she's just given you these, these, these tasks. Now, I'd like you guys to rank them and, 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 and just think about which one would you do first? So I'll just give you some time to do that. Okay, great. So we've got quite a number of people who've who put their answers now. So this is a very, very classical, you know, situation where you've just come back from lunch. You're like, okay, great, I'll get on with my jobs. But actually, you get thrown a million different things, which completely throw you off. And actually, you have to think about prioritization. So when you're doing your A-levels, for example, you might have, you know, eight homework assignments, and you have to think, which of these homework assignments do I need to do first? Which of these um essays should I do first which of these past papers should I do first you know which which subject should I revise from and really from early on from from school all the way to, to medical school for example Shevin, you might have lots of lectures that you need to watch or catch up on you'll prioritize and think about which ones do I need to focus on when you go to placement you also think which which task do I need to prioritize is, is that right would you say yeah, exactly. I think, Mohi, you're touching upon a point that is probably very useful for everyone today to start just thinking about. So actually, if you if you feel like you're quite a disorganized person and, you, you know, you, you struggle to kind of prioritize things and start organizing yourself, maybe today you can start have a, having a think, how can I prioritize my A-levels? How can I start prioritizing the work that I get set from, from, from the teachers? And also, how do I balance kind of other things? So Boho, some people might think that, um, their kind of daily um, exercise or, or, or their yeah. kind of workout during the week or maybe their football match is actually quite a high priority. So you need to start thinking about what are your priorities, what, what is going to help yourself and what is going yeah. to help other people as well, for sure. Exactly, exactly. So I think what you guys have said here is probably, I'd probably agree with that, to be honest. Um, as I say, there's no right answer with these things. Everyone is, it really depends on the scenario. You need more information, et cetera. But actually the patient who's becoming more confused and dehydrated, we're all worried about them, aren't, aren't we guys? You know, you, you're all potential doctors. If, if you were the FY1, you'd think, actually, I, I'm, I'm worried about this patient. Could they be having some sort of kidney infection? Is something going on? So I'd agree. I'd probably, you know, deal with that first. The patient who's in pain, I'd also, you know, probably do that second because, as I say, the, the first patient's probably a bit more unwell, and if we don't do something, they, you know, they have a risk of becoming more unwell, and then a point of irreversible, we can't do much. So I completely agree. But the patient who's in pain, they do need the pain relief. So I'd say the, the actually giving the pain relief, it won't take as long as the first task would do. So for example, what you could do is is be sly and do one and two at the same time, where you ask the nurse to get you the drug chart of the patient. Um, and find out what exactly pain pain relief they're on, et cetera, whilst you're actually walking towards this patient. Um, so trying to do two things at once. So multitasking is, is, is something that you have to do quite often. Now, the third one is very interesting because, as I say, there will be patients who are, for some reason, angry or upset, and you do have to deal with them. And perhaps delaying them and telling them, actually, can you call back in a few hours will, will escalate the issue. But at this point, patient safety is the most important thing. Um, the family member not speaking to them, you know, it, it's not going to risk patient safety. So I completely agree with you guys and, and really well done here for choosing this order. So just very briefly, I'm just talking about the things I've liked so far and things I haven't liked. So I'd say it's a very, very fun and rewarding job. You know, you as even though I'm the most junior doctor in, in the hospital, I, I, there are lots of responsibilities. You do get lots of things done. There's lots of learning opportunities. The team's very friendly. Everyone's very nice. 
Um, and the good thing about the chain of command, people might look at it as a con, but actually, if I have an issue or something I'm concerned about, I can escalate that to the more senior doctor. And if they can escalate it to a more senior doctor, etc. So it's actually very helpful to have that chain of command. Um, you're constantly learning. So as, as Kanal mentioned earlier, from the first week where you know you start, you're learning so much new stuff, just absorbing it all. And, and I think you're all choosing medicine, dentistry, etc. for a reason, because you all like you all like learning. So I think I think that's definitely one very good thing about it. It's very different each day. As I said, even if the job itself is, is a bit repetitive, the patients aren't. Things I haven't liked as much. So the long hours, of course, no one's going to like long hours. But at the same time, if I'm working, for example, on a Saturday and Sunday, I'll get Friday and uh, Monday off. So there is lots of balance. If I'm working night shifts, I'll get the day before off and the day after off. So you can balance the um, the different hours, etc. It, it's definitely possible. Um, so I'd say that's probably the one thing I would say um, I, I, I would probably didn't like as much. But again, you adapt to it. The second thing I'd say is probably this blame culture, which I think exists in every career, where a lot of the time, for example, if something goes wrong, we we always try and point the finger at other people. So if I do something wrong, if, for example, let's say another doctor does something wrong, they might blame me. And then, you know, I'll have to take the blame, even though it wasn't my fault. Or for example, that doctor might blame a nurse, etc. And that's one thing I wouldn't say I like as much, but it's completely outweighed by all the all the things I've liked, I'd say. And yeah, overall, I would say I am enjoying it. Um, yeah. So yeah, so now on to we've talked about that nine to five job. And now we'll talk about that on call side of things where you're out of hours. So for example, 5pm to 9.30, or on a weekend. And what do I mean by out of hours? So actually, at this point, there aren't as many staff as there are on a, on a nine to five. So your consultants will be at home. All your other doctors will basically be at home and there'll just be a few doctors. So, for example, at my own hospital um, from 5 p.m. to 9.30, looking after the medical wards, there's it's it's three FY1 doctors and one registrar. So that's four doctors managing the whole hospital. Um, so I'll, for example, be managing six or seven wards, so about 200 patients. Um, so as I say, that sounds very scary, but actually, you know, it's it's because it's out of hours, I don't need to deal with every single patient. I just need to deal with the ones that are very unwell and the ones that, you know, are more, are more serious. So we're all, you know, let's imagine we're in real life and you guys are here with me at 5 p.m. We're going down to basically handover. So what does this mean? So from a 5, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., if I'm a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. doctor and I'm going home, but I'm worried about a few patients, I can let the on-call doctor know um, to do a few tasks, for example, that need to be done urgently. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. But the main aim of that is that the patient will get 24-hour care, even if I'm not at the hospital or my team isn't. There will always be someone there. And after my 5 p.m. to 9.30 shift, there'll be a night, night shift doctor. So constantly there's always a patient being cared for. So they, these rumors about you know, that there's no, uh, there's only a five day NHS, it's all false, you know, there's always doctors around. Um, but anyway, so we're at this stage, we're all going down, we pick up this bleep. Um, so if you guys have watched things at Grey's Anatomy, etc, you might be um, familiar with this, but essentially, it's a system of getting in touch with doctors. So if Shivam, for example, you're, you're, you're my registrar, and I want to get in touch with you, I'll send you a bleep, which is kind of like a, a text. Um, but on this machine, you'll see that I've, I've bleeped you, and then you'll call me back. Um, so that sort of thing is what we'll do. So let's head down now for handover. And, um, you know, this is a post-COVID world. We're very grateful for all the fantastic work these three have done. They've had wards named after them. Um, and, you know, the doctors hand over these three patients to me. So we have patient A on ward balance. So he's having regular blood tests. They have a chest infection. They're being treated for antibiotics. Um, and I've been asked to chase these. So essentially they mean, you know, find out the results of them. We have patient B on Ward Van Tam who has chronic kidney disease and has a high potassium level. Um, so potassium is one of the core electrolytes that we measure in hospital because having a very low level or very high level can affect the heart and cause a heart to go into an abnormal rhythm. So it's very important that we you know, keep an eye on that. Um, and I've been given this instruction that if it's less than six, then I need to perform an ECG, which is a trace of the heart. And if it's normal, I don't need to treat. And then finally, I've been given a handover for a patient um, who's all I've been told is about a chest x-ray. So you're the FY1 here. And I want you to tell me, 
which 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 handover was 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 most appropriate to you where did you get all the information that you needed which was the best handover out of these so i just I'd like you guys to just poll um and then we'll see what the results are so yeah as i say if you just vote for what your favorite handover was there so shivan whilst whilst we're doing that what sort of things would you say are important if, if someone's handing over a patient to you what, what sort of things do you think we need to know well, I think probably the most important bit is is things like the name and date of birth. So that's something that people forget all the time. So 100%. remember, we, we, we mentioned this earlier, actually, about the age of the patient. The age of the patient is probably the most important detail about them. And the reason for that is because if they're very, very young, they're going to have certain conditions that are more likely or less likely than if they were, let's say, 80 or 90 years old. So the name, exactly. the date of birth, and then probably... The tasks that are most important and things about the patient that you must know so is it that for example their potassium is low is it the fact that yeah. they have um you know lots and lots of white blood cells that are now building up suddenly um you know these are the important things to know but then also mohill bits about things that you might need to do if something went wrong so if something mm. went wrong this is what I'd like you to do. If something is going well, this is something that I'd like you to do. So it's kind of having like a plan A, a plan B, even a plan C sometimes. 100%. So again, so everything you said, Sharon, was fantastic. And I, I completely agree with this. And this is the first, when I had my first on call and I was given patients, there was, there was one patient where I, I'd taken the handover, but I, I didn't even know how old they were or like what their date of birth was. And like, that was really difficult for me to actually manage a job because I had to then find out more about them, et cetera. So I completely agree with you guys. You know, patient B was handed over to us best, but let's look at these handovers. So Shivan mentioned, you need the full name of the patient. You need basically three pieces of information to identify them because patients will have the same names. They'll have the same date, date of births, but what they have that's unique is something called an NHS number. Now we all have an NHS number. It's essentially a code which allows us, um, basically keeps a, a patient identifier. So even if the patient's name and date of birth is the same, we have this NHS number, which, which keeps two patients that have the same details as different. So those are three things we need to know. We need to know where, where these patients are because it's a big hospital, you know, where, where are they? So it's helpful to know where they are so we can manage these jobs. Um, that's, the, that's the next thing that we need to know. We need to know you know, how important is this task? Is this something that needs to be done in this evening? Because if you imagine, I mentioned I'm covering four or five wards. If every ward handed over 10, all their patients to me, I, there'd be no chance I'd be able to get everything done. So you have to be very strict with actually making sure that are the jobs that you're getting relevant and important. Um, so that's what I would say. That's, is this, is this job urgent? And then when they give you that job, you need a bit of background about the patient. So this patient, let's say on ward valence, do we know what type of chest infection they are? How many days have they had antibiotics for? Because if they've had antibiotics, for example, for seven days, do we really need to do much about it? Because they're almost on their full course. Um, so that's what you need to do. And the third, the, the next bit is actually, once you have all that information, what do you want me to do? So you guys, you know, have no medical experience. You're not at medical school, but if someone handed over this to you, you'd, you'd vaguely know what, what, what you have to do, what your task is, right? Because you're told if this is on this, then you do this. It's kind of, in my mind, think of it as a flow chart. If it's this, then do this. If it's that, then do that. So that's the sort of things that when we're thinking about handovers that, that we need to know. So I, I completely agree with you guys. Um, so just moving on. So we're about to manage those jobs, but actually, oh no, a nurse, again, is, is very concerned about a patient's blood sugar level. So um, if anyone has diabetes or anyone knows anyone in the family with diabetes, we measure their blood sugar levels. And if they're very high, it could indicate that their blood sugar control is not very good. If it's very low, it also indicates the same. So we've just been told that it's high. So 21 is, is, is very high um, and they have a background of diabetes. Can you please come and review this patient? So what do we think, guys? So what should we do? Should we, um, okay. Okay, yeah, what, what, what do you guys think we should do? Should we go, should we head over straight there? You're, you're the FY1, so I'm gonna leave it up to you guys. What, what should we do here? Should we get more details? So we're on the phone at the moment, we're very far away from the ward. Should we run over straight there and because the nurse is quite worried or should we just ignore the nurse because he or she are, are probably overreacting? So whilst we're waiting for that, Shivam, um, 
what, what sort of things would you say you're, you're worried about when you're actually becoming an, an FY1? I think something that a lot of students are, are normally a bit scared of is, is being left alone and not knowing mm. what to do. But actually, I think that's an aspect that we well, that we've spoken about so much today. You're always part of the team. You're never exactly. doing anything just by yourself. And I think that's something that's really, really important to take from today. Um, and, and also, Moho, I think another big part of, of, of what we're talking about here as a, as a F1 is that as an F1 doctor, as a junior doctor, you still need to um, kind of promote things to patients that, for example, consultants might do as well. So, yeah, but Moho, you know, even though you're a junior doctor, I'm sure that you still tell patients, you know, how important it is to quit smoking, how important oh, it is to, yeah. to have, a, have a really important diet. So actually, you know, Moho, it doesn't matter if you're an F1 doctor or, or a consultant. Actually, a doctor is a doctor at the end of the day and has the same authority for sure. I completely agree. So yeah, as you mentioned, and actually, I'd say that consultants, you know, they only have five, five minutes with the patient, whereas you're there the whole day. So you're absolutely right. In, in the past, I've noticed, they've asked this patient why they're smoking or not, but they've not actually asked them to stop smoking or actually offer that advice. And if you don't even offer it, how can you expect someone to actually, you need to do that intervention. So you're absolutely right. So even though I'm an FY1, you still have that responsibility. Um, and yeah, so coming on to this, I agree with 145 here. So I agree. So thinking about the scenarios, this patient has a high sugar level. So we have to think about the things that what sort of things can cause a high sugar level. So Shivam, if you've just eaten a meal, for example, what, what will happen to your sugar level? Yeah. So as soon as you've had a meal, your glucose level, so your blood sugar levels will start to rise and they'll actually start to rise pretty rapidly as well, because your, your, your body's absorbing all this glucose all of a sudden. But then Moho, as we know, and, and for a lot of you that kind of do biology will realize that your body produces a hormone that then starts to reduce mm -hmm. that, that blood glucose. But actually, Moho, what if a patient, um, their normal glucose levels were actually quite high? Um, mm. and, and this is this is something that I just thought about right now, because, yes, you said their blood glucose, I think it was 21. We don't actually know. Maybe this patient's normal blood glucose is 18 or 19 or maybe even 20. So actually... We don't really know, do we? I'm glad you said that because as I say, so if you just take that one piece of information on isolation, you have no idea because you need to first of all find out, as Shivam said, what is their normal glucose level? If it's high already, then you know, you're know you not as concerned as you would be if, for example, their glucose is normally normal. The second thing is, I would ask is when did they have their last meal? So if they've literally just eaten and their sugar is at high, all of us, if we ate, our, our sugar would be very, very high. So having this information allows you to prioritize again. You've already been given all these jobs from all these boards. You have this nurse who's asking, you know, it's, it's very fair that they're, they're concerned. Um, so definitely you would go on the ward and, and find out more and reassure them, et cetera. But at this stage, we need that information. What is their normal um, glucose level, et cetera. So rather than running straight onto the ward, you should get these details first, because in my head, if I knew that, for example, their blood sugar is normally that high, that they've just had a meal, I would add it to my, um, my my list of things to do um, and then i would deal with it later but as i say 21 is is abnormally high if if it was for example 11 or 12 then it would be perhaps normal so we wouldn't expect it to be that high normally but yeah it's just something to bear in mind always get more information um from whoever calls you so now let's deal with each of our patients so we have the first patient who has had their blood test that come back so again you guys are the fy1 so i'm going to just give you a small explanation to what these numbers mean. So the hemoglobin, um, so that's all about the amount of red blood cells in your body. And if someone's hemoglobin is low, that indicates that they have anemia. And let's say in this stage, this is, for example, a um, female patient, you know, just for the sake of the scenario. Your white cells, so your white cells deal with infection. Um, and if they're raised, it could indicate that, for example, your body is fighting an infection because it has a natural immune response. In terms of white cells, there's lots of different types of white cells, which you may have learned about in biology. Now, I'm just going to tell you about two of them today. You have your neutrophils and your lymphocytes. So your neutrophils, these, they're both made in the bone marrow. And what your neutrophils do is that they deal with mainly kind of bacterial infections. So if, for example, there's a bacterial infection, your body will ingest that bug, for example, and perform something called phagocytosis. So phagocytosis, and I'd recommend watching a video and finding out about that later. Um, so that's what your neutrophils will do, dealing with bacterial infections. Your lymphocytes, they generally deal with more viral infections. So for example, 
with viruses, as you know from biology, they, they act on the body in a different way. So if your lymphocytes are raised, you may expect that the patient has a viral infection. But as I said, this is not always naturally true. It's not a blanket rule. But just, just to give you a gross idea of the patient and the platelets, these are platelets are um, um, used to thin your blood. So if your platelet level can tell you, for example, if the patient's um, a gross kind of idea of how well the blood is clotting. So now, what do we think as these of, of these blood tests? So if we just do another poll again, um, so I think it should, yeah, so I think you're able to type your response. So if people are just able to just um, type, well, what do we think about these blood? So we'll just get a few, few results in. So I'll just go back to them. Um, Okay, we're not able to view them for some reason. Um, I'll just carry on for now. But Shivan, what, what, what do you think about these? Are you, are you able to see it from your side or? No, no, I can't, can't quite see it. But I think um, with regards to those blood tests, I thought the, yeah, if you just double check, because I think it, I think they should be coming up. Um, yeah, if you just stick to this slide, Moho. So I think um, most of the people probably saw that the neutrophils were, were quite high. Um, yeah. Moho, can you just tell everyone just a bit about things that are borderline? Because, you know, something like the 3.9, you know, technically it's actually within the range, isn't it? It's between one and four. Yeah. So so what what do you think that in terms of the big take home point from today? What 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 do you think that should show? Is that concerning or is that completely fine? Do you think? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think if the, the, the main point is if the if the results in the range, then you don't have to worry about it as much because um, for example, this patient's platelet count is 200. It's it's even though it's on the lower side of the range, it's still normal. Patients' lymphocytes, again, it's 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 still within the range. So I wouldn't worry about them. But uh, I'm I'll just come on to this actually. So again, it's about being really you're, you're a detective as a doctor. So if I just looked at those blood tests and I would, I saw that, for example, the white cells are high, the neutrophils are high. Um, I think, oh gosh, like we, we, we need to do something, but actually we, we need to see the previous blood test results. So if we look at these one by one, so the hemoglobin, so patient is not anemic because as I say, it's one, two, seven, it's well within the range. As we said, it's a female, the white cells, so the white cells are slightly um, higher, but they've come down. So even though they're 14.8, they've come down to 12.7. And that tells us that, you know, the antibiotics that we're giving are working. Next onto the neutrophils. So the neutrophils, again, are raised. So that tells us it's probably a bacterial infection. Um, but as I say, it's, it's, it's improving. And the lymphocytes have increased marginally, but I wouldn't worry about that. So the main take home from this is actually, number one, don't look at results in isolation. Look at the trend. And number two, don't get too bogged down by the results, because, for example, if this patient, you know, had a normal white cell and you looked at them and they looked very unwell, they were coughing, they didn't look like themselves. Shivan, what's more important, the, the numbers or the actual looking at the patient? Yeah, exactly. So at the end of the day, it's just about seeing the patient themselves. So, yeah. you know, I think this is a really good point that you're making here, because at the end of the day, references and, you know, blood test results, you know, they're, they're important. But do you think they're the be all end all? Do you think that is the most important thing? You know, blood test results mm. you, is is that is that you know the main aspect of, of of being a doctor in terms of interpretation? Definitely not, definitely not, because a patient's blood test could be normal and actually they're they're on the floor. So you, you, we do get bogged down in numbers, etc. But the main thing is it's all about the patient. Um, so yeah, I'll move on now just because we're we're running short of time. Um, so the patient with hyperkalemia so luckily I've got Shivan with me um he's he's on his placement so he's actually offered to, to take the blood for me which is which is fantastic um and whilst he's doing that I'll deal with the other other jobs and then we have that chest x-ray that's come back for that patient um and I think previously we we, we touched on chest x-rays in, in L's talk um so I'm not going to go into them in too much detail but essentially we've got this chest x-ray and we want to go through in a systematic manner. And I've got a few mnemonics here that help me remember things. So we've got RIPE and we've got A, B, C, D, E. Uh, and I'm not going to go through each of them one by one just for the sake of time, but I definitely go back and watch this and go through each of these systems. So I'll just explain some of the acronyms or some of the jargon for you. So the clavicle, that's this bone here. So that's just showing these. So you want to make sure that they're equally from the equal distance from the spine. We have your anterior ribs. So on this x-ray, you'll see that there's these curves, if, if my arrow is showing them, but we also have these curves as well. So these more obvious curves are the anterior ribs. 
So these are the ribs on the front, and then we have the posterior ribs on the back of the rib cage. So that's at the back. And then the exposure. So the exposure is just telling you how well the film is. So is it too dark? Is it too bright? So I'd say this is probably around the right level. Um, and then we just look through it systematically. So we look at the airway, so the trachea, which is here. It's nice and central. We look at the lung fields. We look at the heart size. So Shivam, you mentioned uh, dextrocardia in the in the previous section. So does this patient have dextrocardia? Well, actually, if we look at this here, Mohil, we can see that actually the, the heart, believe it or not, isn't actually what people think in terms of being right mm. on the left hand side. It is actually quite central, but it is slightly more towards the left. So actually here we can see that this seems pretty much perfect in terms of the location of the yeah. heart. We can see quite a large chunk is still on that left hand side. But then how do we know it's on the left hand side? Well, actually, our X-ray tells us if we look at the top right hand corner there, it says a big L and that L there is a, is basically telling you that that's the left side of the patient. So if you're ever confused, if you ever don't, if you, if you don't know which kind of way round this X-ray is, well, actually don't worry because the X-ray will always tell you um, and it, will, it shows there that it's on the left. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, I, I get confused all the time because for example, there'll be like, oh, this patient's on the right side and I'm like, that's not the right, that, that, like, it's very easy to get mixed up. But yeah, definitely refer to, for example, that will show you where um, the abnormality is. So just, just for the purpose of time, I'll actually point out where the abnormality is. But if, for example, you're presented with this, you just have to look at this and you, again, don't look at it in isolation. You'll compare it to another X-ray and see has this pneumonia gotten worse. But we can see on this side, there's a bit of whiteness um, on the X-ray. And essentially in terms of colors on an X-ray, black is air, solid white is bone. And then anything in between can be liquid. It could be, um, for example, infection, etc. So just because it's quite irregular and I can't see any kind of straight uh, line, which I, I, it points me to, towards an infection. Um, so in this instant, we, we spotted this infection ship. And so what do we do? So, you know, these, these guys are the FY1s. Are they going to call the registrar, who's a more senior doctor? Are they going to start them on antibiotics because of the x-ray? Or are you, are you going to find out about the patient? You've only got, you know, 10 minutes at 8.50 and your shift finishes at nine. What are you going to do at this point? You know, you don't have much time available. Yeah, so I think actually... There's, these are things that we actually have to start thinking about all at once. So actually, you do need to think about potentially calling someone if you feel like it's going to get serious. You do actually need to think about, OK, if this is really bad, I need to give antibiotics. But I think at the end of the day, Moha, we, we've just taken this X-ray in isolation and we need to find out more about the patient, I think. Just read their notes. And I think like a lot of people have put here there, we need to look at the notes. And Moha, if you just actually go back one slide, I just want to yeah. point, actually... Um, People who are being very, very observant here might have noticed something. So, Moho, what I want you to do is on that left hand side of the X ray. Yeah. Can you see that curve that is coming towards the bottom there? Can you see it's kind of like a whitish curve? This one? There we go. Uh, no, no, no. Just above that. This one? Nope. Uh, to the right. So, bit down, bit down, bit down. There we okay. go. There it is. Okay. okay. So, so, again, a lot of people are probably looking at that and being like, oh, my God, like there's look, at, <laughs> there's, there's something wrong there, isn't there, Mohill? You can see that there's some sort of curve. It's, it's, it's kind of whitish and it's, it's on top of that lung. Well, actually, guys, do you know what this is? This is actually the patient's um, breast. So that's actually their left breast there. So we know that this is a female patient just from looking at this X-ray because that breast there is actually coming there and it's kind of curving around towards the bottom of the lung. There's some people who saw this probably were like, wow, that, 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 that seems to be, there's some, mm. there might be something abnormal in the lungs. And actually, Mohill, that's, that's not right, is it? No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, so just coming back to this part. Um, so... Yeah, so we want to find, even if you've got five minutes left, you need to find out more about the patient. So, for example, are there antibiotics? What's the previous x-ray? What's the consultant done on the day? Because we're, all of us, we're just, we don't know this patient. The consultant, the day team will know that patient. So we have to trust what they've said. And in that morning ward run that we talked about, the consultant will have come up with a plan. So, for example, you know, if chest x-ray is abnormal, do this. So that's why it's really important to get that information. You're a detective at the end of the day. You don't know this patient. You can't just look at an image and think, okay, that's it. So it's one word that people love in medicine is holistic. And it's really important you take the holistic approach. 
what's what's been happening to the care of the patient it, it, it's all very important to to think about and um, so yeah just in, in the interest of time so we're all handing over now so it's 9 p.m now uh, so we finished our very long uh, shift from 9 a.m and now we're going to hand over patients so i'm not sure if it will appear but um what sort of things so if you're if you could just reply to the instagram story of my picture um and just tell me what sort of things would you say would make a good good handover and after that, we'll do a few questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll move straight on to the next bit. So whilst, we're, whilst you guys are just telling me that, um, I'll just, so yeah, yeah, fantastic. So someone's mentioned, oh, there we go. They're coming up now. So good communication skills, detailed instructions about the jobs, um, details, giving the patient, this is, fantastic guys you're all ready to be doctors now this is brilliant isn't it Shivam so you know we can see it's very important to get a name and age to get the notes find out what the jobs are to do the NHS number communication skills update on the main this is fantastic so I, th I think you know they're all ready to be doctors now wouldn't you agree I think to be honest babe this is the most important part from today is actually realizing what do you need? What what skills do you need to be a good doctor? And we can actually see here that communication is it's there, big and bold, and lots of people have realised how important it is. Um, so I think again, guys, this is a really big point from today: is how can you continue to improve your communication? Well, the way that you can do that is, you know, part get, getting involved in societies, getting involved in sport always helps your communication. You're talking with 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 each other. You're talking to people in a team. I think also getting involved in kind of the volunteering, um, doing these things like the calling, like calling elderly people if you can. Th these are all things that, that will make such a big difference in terms of communication. No one is ever born, Mohill, with good communication, are they? It's exactly. You, no, definitely not. It's, it's just something that you acquire over time and it comes with experience for sure. Brilliant. So I'll just answer maybe three questions um, and then move on just because we don't have much time. Um, so let me just pick out some questions. So how early do you start specialising for surgery? So after you do this FY1, FY2, you're at this junction where you decide, do I want to do medicine, which is, for example, respiratory, etc.? Do I want to do surgery where you, you go down that surgery pathway or do I want to do something like GP? Um, so it's normally after the two years that you decide. Um, do I believe junior doctors are overworked? Well, I think it, it's a very, very broad question. And I think it depends on which hospital um, there are people are at. So for example, at certain hospitals, people might have more difficult rotor. Mine, I, I, in my opinion, I, I think it's fair. So for example, if I have long shifts, I have time to rest in between. I also use my um, holiday well. So for example, before my own calls. Um, so in my opinion, I wouldn't say overworked, definitely stretched. Um, and I think because it's a free national health service, there's only so much that we can do. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, and I'll just pick one last question. Um, so how hard is it as a first year doctor? So I'd say it's not easy. It's definitely not easy, but it's also not extremely difficult. Um, there will be days where I come home and I'm just like, that was really, really tough day. And like, you're, you're stressed and you just have to go home, you know, leave, try and leave your work at work and just relax. Then the next day you start again. And I think the, the thing with medicine is it can be a bit of a rat race in the sense that every day you're, you're constantly, even if you have a tough day, you have to, you know, go back in, etc. But I think we're moving more towards a more mental health focused world where, for example, if patients are over, um, overworked or burdened, you can get that rest. And I think it's very important, you know, from, from year 12 to medical school to being a doctor, the reason that medical schools want you to do extracurricular, et cetera, is because it, you know, I've, I've been down the whole school with medic mind with medical school, et cetera. And there are times where it can be overwhelming. So I need to take a step back and actually think, you know, just, just take a break because you can easily burn out. And I think from now, it's really important that you get, you just force yourself even to take breaks, to do extracurricular, do lots of sport. If you're not sporty, you know, Think of other hobbies like reading books, etc. Um, so yeah, that's that's the thing I'd say. Um, so I think that's it for now. Um, if anyone has any other questions, you know, definitely um, ask on our Instagram, and we'll try and reply to you as as, as 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 soon as we can. But I'll just hand it over now to um, Dr. Dr. Nisha. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So um, thanks a lot, Mohil, for that talk. It was, it was really, really insightful for all of us. 
Um, and now we reach the final stage of the afternoon. Um, so you guys have heard from Shivam, you've heard from Ellie, you've heard from Mohil at different stages of the medicine career. And now we're working up towards the top nearly where Nishma is. Uh, and Nishma is a GP. Um, and she's, as I mentioned before, she's done lots of different work in different parts of the NHS. So hopefully she can talk for half an hour or so and share some insight with you guys. And at the end of that, we will do the closing bit where we'll give you all your um, um, proof of coming to the event, etc. So this is the last half an hour, guys. And Nishma, I'll, I'll pass it over to Nishma now to um, talk to you guys. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, we can hear you all. Great. So uh, my name's Nish. I'm a GP registrar in Cambridge. I know that it's been a really it sounds like it's been a really good afternoon and I've dipped in and out and really enjoyed some of the talks that I've heard, but also a long afternoon. And it's a Saturday night. so You're probably tired and hungry. So I'll try and keep this short. And I just thought I'd wake you all up with a card trick to start with because you've had lots and lots of talking. So I'm going to show you a set of cards and I want you to pick one for me and just hold it in your head. So focus on one card. You got one card in your head. Hold that in your head. Hopefully you can remember it. And now I'm going to make your card disappear. Did I do it? Hopefully I did. And the thing is, there was a moment there where some of you will have thought, how on earth did she do that? And that's how I felt when I was at your stage. Every time I came across a medical student or a doctor, some of the people that you've had speaking to you today, I used to think, how on earth did they do that? And then a, a quieter voice would say, could I do that too? And I really believed that I couldn't do it because I thought that it was magic. But it's not magic, really, just like this wasn't. And if you haven't worked it out already, I'll show you how I did it. So the top row shows you the cards that I showed you the first time and the second row are the cards I showed you the second time. So a completely different set of cards. So it wasn't magic at all. And being a, becoming a doctor is not magic either. You just need to work out the steps to do it and you can do it too. Just like you can all do that card trick now that I've shown you how to do it. So I thought I'd just start with saying that if you're feeling a bit kind of daunted or overwhelmed right now, which probably I would be if I was in year 12 and listening to these amazing people talk to you, you can all do it. I really believe that you can. And I never thought that I could. I never thought that I would be here talking to you guys about becoming a doctor and being a GP. So that's me. I'm Nish. I'm a GP registrar. I'm in my final year of training at um, a practice in Cambridge uh, as a GP. And it's a real pleasure to come and speak to you today. And Gunnell and the team asked me to come and talk to you about general practice. And I said yes for two reasons, really. Firstly, because Cornell's my cousin and I think I'd probably get in a lot of trouble if I didn't say yes. But also because I thought it was a good opportunity to share something with you that not many people know. And that's that when I was at your stage, I was actually really unsure about becoming a doctor. I went through the process, of course I did, that's why I'm here. And I went through all the hoops that you guys will be going through. And I even landed at medical school at Imperial in 2005. And I still wasn't sure. And the reason was because when I thought about the kind of doctor that I wanted to be, I wasn't sure that it was going to live up to that. And I think if I'd known then what I know now, that being a GP was going to let me be the kind of doctor that I wanted to be, I would have saved myself a whole load of worry. And that's really what I want to share with you today. So I thought really I would just start with some stories of some patients that I've seen in my practice over the last few months, just to give you a flavor about what general practice is about and the kind of things that we see. So this is Jodie. Jodie is 17 years old. And because of COVID, what we're doing at the moment in general practice is people have to ring in before they come to the surgery. So Jodie rang me and she said, Dr. Manick, I've got this spot on my breast. And I, I wondered if you could examine me, please. And she sounded really distraught on the phone. So I said, of course, Jodie, you can come in. You can come in in a couple of hours, actually. I've got a slot. So 
So she came in that same day and she walked in the room just really anxious, wringing her hands and just looking terrified. And I said, okay, let's just examine you straight away. Let's get right to it and see what's going on. And as soon as I looked at her breast, I knew that there was nothing wrong. It was it was a skin tag, really. It wasn't even part of her breast. And I said, Jodie, it's okay. It's just a, it's just part of your skin. It's fine. It's not a lump. It's, you know, it's not cancer. It's nothing to worry about. And it was as though an entire weight had been lifted off Jodie's shoulders and the light came back on in her eyes. She smiled and she looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, thank you so much, Dr. Manick. And as she was getting dressed again and, and going out, she said she was telling me about a new job that she's got at a garden centre in Cambridge, which is starting soon, which is quite exciting for her and that she's got a boyfriend and we were just chatting. And I was really happy for her. And then she left. Now, on the surface, that might sound like quite a boring consultation. Not very much happened there. But the thing is, I know Jodie's story. So I know one day when Jodie was just 15, she woke up in the morning and her stomach was really swelled up. Her and her mum were absolutely horrified and they took her to A&E. And unfortunately, Jodie found out that she had cancer of her ovaries. She was only 15. And after that, she had to have her ovaries removed, her uterus removed, lots of surgery, lots of chemotherapy. And thankfully, she's actually going to be OK now. She'll never be able to have children of her own, but she's going to be OK. And only a few months ago, she was discharged from follow up from the hospital. So when Jodie phones me and she tells me that she has something on her breast, I know that she's going to be really worried. Wouldn't you be in her shoes? And I also know it's really important that we get it looked at very quickly and if appropriate, we reassure her. And now Jodie's been discharged from the hospital. I'm actually the only health professional that she sees who knows that story. And I will always know that story. So it's not quite the, the boring consultation that you thought it was. I'm part of Jodie's story. And this is Stuart. So Stuart works as a journalist in Fleet Street in London. And of course, this isn't actually Stuart. It's just a picture of what I imagine he was doing commuting from Cambridge to London before the pandemic. And he rang me up and said, Dr. Malik, I'm feeling really stressed and I'm feeling really tired. And at that point, I, I didn't really know him, actually. And no alarm bells were ringing because we get lots of people calling us, telling us they're tired, especially during COVID times. And we spoke a few times. And after a while, he said something that really just made me curious. He said, the culture in my workplace is just really hard and I have to stay awake and I can't cope. And I, I asked him a bit more about what he meant. What, what do you mean the culture in your workplace? And to cut a long story short, eventually Stuart confessed to me that he'd been starting to take crack cocaine. I was really shocked. So this is a middle middle-aged, middle-class man living in a very nice suburb in Cambridge, went to a good university, and he told me he was taking crack cocaine. And he said, Doc, it's getting out of control. And over the following months, I managed to persuade him to get some help, to talk to someone, and he went off to the drug and alcohol service. And about eight months later, he came back to me and he was clean. And he said, thank you very much, Dr. Manick. I couldn't have done that without you. So I was part of Stuart's story. And finally, this is Enid. Enid's 94. And one day we got a call from the practice saying Enid needs a home visit. Now, she's 94 and got lots of medical problems, but actually she didn't like to ever bother the doctor. So when I opened her medical record, it was quite blank. She hardly had any interaction with us. She just didn't want to bother the NHS. So I decided to go out and see her. It's the first time I'd met her. And I pulled up on my bicycle, as everyone does in Cambridge, to this giant house. I don't know how many bedrooms it had, but it was enormous. And there's this tiny little old lady who opens the door and she lives alone. So I was thinking, oh, this tiny lady living in this enormous house. And I walked in the door and as I looked to my left, there was this enormous drawing room. And in the drawing room was the biggest grand piano that I've ever seen. I couldn't believe it. And as we went up the stairs, there were all these photographs on the stairs of her playing the piano. And she told me the story of how she'd been a world-class international pianist in her life, traveling the world, recording and all sorts. 
And we went up to her bedroom and she had tummy pain. So I examined her tummy and I put one hand on her stomach and I knew right away that something was very wrong. It was very hard. It was very lumpy and it didn't feel right at all. In fact, my gut instinct told me at that point that she had a very serious cancer. We had quite a difficult conversation and then Enid said to me, you know what, doctor, I've had my lot. I don't want any tests. I don't want any investigations. I just want to be comfortable. So over the next few weeks, I managed to get her some help at home. We got her some iron because she was a bit low in iron and feeling very tired. We had a dietitian come and make sure that she was getting enough to eat. And I got a call three weeks later from her daughter to say that Enid passed away peacefully at home. I was quite shocked, actually. It was sooner than I expected. And the daughter said to me, thank you very much for being her doctor. So I was part of Enid's story. And my point of telling you those stories is not because it was clever medicine, because it wasn't, but to, to show you really that being a GP is not the kind of medicine that's very glamorous, like you see on TV. We don't run around, you know, jumping on people's chests or cutting people open, but we get to pay, play a part in people's stories. And we actually get to shape people's stories. And that's a privilege that I really cannot put into words. Every day I wake up and I know I'm going to help 30 or 40 people with their stories that day, even if it's just listening to them. And if you remember nothing else from this talk, this is just one quote that I'd like to leave with you, which is, in hospital, diseases stay and patients come and go. And you heard the last speaker describe that really well. And in general practice, patients stay and diseases come and go. For us, it's all about getting to know the patients and understanding how their illnesses impact on their lives. And that's really special. So I could leave it there, but I'll just tell you a little bit more about me and I'm happy to take any questions if you have it. So um, this is the school that I went to. It's a state school in Watford. It's a good state school. And I actually was terrible at science. So how did I end up being a doctor? Well. I was, um, I was kind of a B plus C science student. I was the sort of person that no one ever wanted to partner with in chemistry because I would usually burn something or break something, not intentionally, I just really clumsy. And I didn't have a lot of confidence at all in myself. And I got to year nine and I didn't look, this isn't a picture of me, by the way, I look young, but I, I don't know that young. Um, I got to about year nine and the, my biology teacher said to me at parents evening, she said, you know what, you're actually really good at science, you just don't believe that you are. And something about what she said that day just stayed with me forever. And I probably would credit the reason I went to, med to medical school because of this one teacher who was called Miss Bullock. And it was that belief that she had in me and I managed to turn it around completely. I started to work a bit harder, I believed in myself, I did a bit better and I couldn't believe it. I ended up doing science A-levels, which I never ever would have believed someone told if someone told me that. And I then thought, well, I want to, you know, I, I think I want to help people and I thought I'll go into medicine. But my point here is some advice that I wish I'd sort of had at that time was you are good enough. So if you're sitting there worrying if you if you are or you're not, I'm here to tell you that you are good enough. And don't let other people's perceptions of you limit you. Because if it wasn't for that one person telling me that, I genuinely would not be here today. So I kind of got to A-levels, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I thought, well, I like science and I want to help people. And the thing is, you'll be told not to say that in your personal statements, but because it's because what everyone says, they like science and they want to help people, but it's true. And I think if that's true for you, you should say that. And I, so I went on and I tried a lot of different things in work experience. I tried dentistry, physiotherapy, optometry. They all felt a bit too narrow for me. And I thought medicine had some breadth to it. So I chose medicine. But as I said to you before, something that not many people know is I really wasn't sure. My friends that were going through the hoops of applying to medicine were all 100% committed. Lots of them came from medical families. They really, really knew that they wanted to do medicine. They were going to do anything to get there. And I had doubts all the way through. I just didn't know what it was going to be like. And so my second bit of advice to you is it's OK not to be sure. I kind of wish someone had said that to me because I spent a lot of energy worrying whether it really was okay not to be sure that I wanted to be a doctor. And I think it is okay. And frankly, how can you know 
when you're 17, 18, you know exactly what it's like. You don't, you don't know. And I had lots of wobbles through medical school wondering if it was the right thing to do. For me, when I found general practice, that was the time that I was convinced, but it took me a while. So I was the first doctor in our family and Kunal is now going to be the second doctor in our family. So that's really exciting. But I did get there first, Kunal. <laughs> I was the first doctor in the family. And, you know, people were quite excited. I think we've, uh, Kunal will tell you, you've come from a really big family. So lots of aunts, lots of uncles. Everyone was very excited. But they were already talking about, you know, what kind of specialist are you going to be? What kind of surgeon are you going to be? And I thought, don't you know me? I'm really clumsy. I would never be a surgeon. But you know, what kind of hospital doctor are you going to be? And I was thinking about general practice, even at, even at that stage during medical school. And the reason was, when you think, when you close your eyes and someone asks you to picture a doctor, who do you picture? For most people, it's their GP. And that's my GP down there, Dr. Jenner, who's still around today uh, in Hatch End. And I would picture him and I really liked him. And I thought, you know, that's quite special that you could pick anybody off the street and say, Who's your, you know, who do you think about when you think about your doctor? And they would usually picture their GP. So it was already on my radar quite early on. And then I graduated from Imperial in 2011. And this is the day that I got my results uh, in, in our bar at Imperial, which is in the basement called the Reynolds. I got my results and I realized I was gonna be a doctor. And if you ever meet this man, don't ever tell him that I said, this was the happiest day of my life. Cause that man, man ended up being my husband and uh, I should probably say it was my wedding day. So he doesn't know this, but this is probably the happiest day of my life getting my results. But all of the people in this picture and all of my friends went into specialties after medical school. They, you know, they decided they were going to become neurologists like my husband or surgeons. And I was the only one out of all of them that chose general practice at that stage already. And the reason was I really loved everything during medical school. I loved all the rotations and I didn't I wasn't really ready to stop any of them. I liked all of them, except maybe surgery, because I was really clumsy, as I said. But I liked all of them. And whenever I was doing hospital placements, I always used to wonder what happened to the people when they left the ward. I was really curious to think about the impact of the illness on that person's life and their livelihood going forwards. So I felt like general practice was going to help me to follow that up. And the third reason really was because GPs seemed to me to be the happiest people. And I think at the time I thought they seemed to have the most control over their working week. And I'll tell you a bit more about that soon. So I chose GP. And the other thing I'd mention here is that GP is the shortest career path. So I went on and did foundation training, two years of foundation training in Oxford. And then I chose to do general practice. And that's only three more years. So my husband, who I've said is a neurologist, is, you know, I'm about to qualify. The reason it's taken me a bit longer is because I've taken a few detours and I've had a baby along the way. My husband, from the point of being an F a foundation year two doctor to becoming a consultant is going to be 11 years for him. He's doing a PhD at the moment, which a lot of specialty doctors unfortunately have to do to, to be competitive. I literally have to do three years, which is at this time of taking this picture, I don't think I really appreciated how good that was. But actually, you know, I'm in my 30s. I just want to get on and I want to qualify and I want to be there. And just having three years is great. And I also never have to do nights or weekends again, which is amazing. And you heard the last speaker talking about night shifts and it was bringing back like quite bad memories. And I never, ever have to do that again, which is amazing. So another great reason to choose GP. So I guess what I would say here is stay true to yourself because all of my friends were going off doing specialties and really excited about that. And I thought, you know what? No, I want to be a GP. I'm going to do it. And what's very interesting is that three of our really good friends have now converted to general practice after following specialty careers for a few years and realizing it wasn't for them. So stay true to yourself, whatever you want to do. So I hope this works, um, but I just got a quick kind of word cloud up. I want you to tell me what comes to your mind when you think of general practice. Um, so for this, I think people need to go to Menti. Is that right? Yeah, there's a, I think it should be the same code. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. But let's see. Oh, there we go. One second. Let me just get it up. It's, it's showing on my screen. 
are you able to see the questions? Mohul can see on his coming through. So, so maybe, so maybe um, Mohul can share a screen and then you can just talk over it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So we've got things like lifesaver, secondary care, help, holistic family medicine, patient contact, flexibility, sitting all day. So we'll talk about that. Thank you for saying that. Desk job, gateway to the NHS, very interesting. Holistic care, family, paracetamol, we'll talk about that. Jack of all trades, we'll also talk about that. Thank you. Flexibility, lots of people saying that. Doctor patient relationship, long term, exactly. That's absolutely true. Dealing with patients of all ages, you only need to study for 13 years, <laughs> yeah. Approachable, friendly. My mother, oh, that's nice. Is your mother my GP? Okay. Um, a doctor treating wide range of diseases, family doctor, compassionate. The person that knows other people that know stuff. Yeah, that is also true. I also know stuff, by the way. <laughs> um, okay, great. Okay, thanks very much. So we can stop that there. I get, I get a feel for what you're, what you're thinking about general practice, and we're going to address some of those things. So I share my screen again. Uh, there we go. Great. So I thought I would help with some of those thoughts by telling you a bit about the day in the life of a GP. And I have to say, this isn't really my day at the moment because I'm a trainee, so it's slightly different. Trainees in general practice now do pretty much a nine to five, which is amazing. So I'll make sure I say that first because a new GP contract came in not that long ago for trainees, which means that we are obligated to do a nine to five. So I literally get in the door about quarter to nine and I leave at quarter past five. And I have a daughter who's at nursery. So this is really, really important. I don't think if I did any other spe specialty, I'd be able to pick her up and drop her. So the day I'm going to show you is a day of a qualified GP, because I guess that's, you know, that's what I will actually be doing for the rest of my life. So I think it's more important to show you that. But as a trainee, my days are much shorter than this. So we'll just go through it briefly. Most GPs get in quite early, 7.45 to 8.30. And I'll tell you now that I'm not here to sort of sell general practice to you. I'm just telling you the truth of it. So there are some downsides here that you'll see. It's a long day. There's a lot of paperwork and results and letters to go through. Most people will start seeing and phoning patients from around 8.30. And at the moment with COVID, what's happening is patients in our practice are calling in and saying, I want to speak to a doctor. They get put on my phone list and I have to call them back. So I call them all. And then if I want to bring somebody in, like I told you about Jodie, if I want to bring her in, I then bring her in and I fit her into my diary. So there's a lot of kind of phone triage at the moment, which, which is um, interesting. It's more efficient, but it is a lot of kind of screen time. Um, we have a team coffee at 10.30 all the time in my practice. So it is a desk job, like somebody said, but you always get out and you get to sit down with your team. And the great thing I'd say here is your team is very stable in general practice. It's like having a family. And that's not the case when I was a hospital doctor when I was doing my F1 and F2 rotations. You are part of a team, like the other speakers have said, but that team changes a lot. You move on every six months. Most people in that team are moving on all the time. The consultant is, is stable, so they are usually there all the time, but the team is constantly changing. And I found that really hard. I'd find a really good team and then six months later, I'd be moving on. Whereas when you join a, a practice, it's like joining a family. It's a very stable team. It's a lovely environment. People know knock on my door if I'm not there at team coffee at 10 30 someone is knocking on my door saying Nisha are you okay can I help you and do you want me to come and make you a coffee and bring it to you and it's a really nice you do feel really looked after which is which is absolutely great and the other thing is you know like you can't pick your family but you can pick a, a GP family so um you can try out all different types of practices and find one that you like before you stay there um so going back to the day so team coffee and then you have a bit of time before lunch, again, more kind of processing results that come through from the hospital, writing referral letters, reading referrals that are coming back to you. So there is a bit of admin work that goes on. And then from one to two, um, you might be going on some home visits. And that's really nice, actually, because you get out of the practice. As I mentioned, in the Enid's home visit that I did, you get to go into people's houses, which is really nice and kind of see their whole environment, like where this person lives. And you really get a feel for all the factors that influence people's health, which I don't think you quite get in the hospital when someone is in a, in a hospital gown on a bed. You don't really understand what their lives are like. And you get to do that in general practice. Um, we have practice meetings again, so we talk about things in the practice and we have lunch as well. 
Um, so, but yeah, I'd say the day's busy. So quite a busy day back in the afternoon, phoning and seeing patients. So I'd say by five o'clock as a trainee, I'm out the door going to pick up my daughter. It's brilliant. The GPs in my practice are still there and they'll usually be there till about seven. So um, the days are hard. I would never choose general practice because it's an easy option. The days are hard. But what I would say here is nobody does weekends. Nobody does nights. And most GPs in my practice work three or four days a week. So I don't know, I probably couldn't tell you right now a single GP that I know that does this five days a week. That was probably because it's quite hard, but also it might tell you from a financial point of view, and people don't really talk about money, but that you can actually earn enough in three or four days a week and do what you want on the other days. And we'll come on to that. So I'm kind of going to go towards the end now and tell you a bit about my four main reasons why I chose general practice. Now, the first is this. So I don't know if you can see this and anyone that's a medical student will probably recognise this book. It's the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. And the thing about this book is it's got all different chapters of all different specialties, whether it's respiratory medicine, skin medicine, kids, obstetrics, gynaecology, which is women's health, you know, absolutely everything. And what I really love about general practice is that in the course of even one day, I will go from one end of this book to the other. I will never really know what's walking in the door and I will never close down a chapter in this book because I need to know a little bit about a lot. And I would probably actually say that GPs in my practice who've been doing this for a while, they know a lot about a lot. And I think that's really quite special. A specialist will know a lot about one thing, one area, how to investigate it and how to treat it. So to give you an idea as a comparison, this is my husband's favourite book in the world. Look how thick that is. It's called Principles of Neural Science. And he is often found reading this book late into the day. No, it's not like that. He's not that much of a talk. But look how much he needs to know about one area. I never, ever need to buy a book like that. And I love that fact. Um, someone said jack of all trades. And I think GPs are a jack of all trades. And someone said to me, but are you a jack of all trades and a master of none? And I'll tell you something that I'll give you a freebie that you can use in a GP interview when you're applying for general practice. Do you know that the full quote of that is, it's a jack of all trades, a master of none, but that's better than being the master of one. So that is the full quote of that. And all I'll say there is that I think being a jack of all trades is brilliant. It's better than being a master of one like this. And um Actually, a lot of things don't even reach specialists in the hospital. 90% of patient contact happens in the NHS, in, in primary care, in general practice. 90%, which most people don't know. Now, my second reason is this. And as you've already seen today, what happens when you go to medical school is you learn the skills of how to take a really good history, how to examine people and how to decide what to do next. And the thing I love about general practice is that is still true every day. I think being a GP is like being a proper doctor all the time. I have to take a really good history. I have to examine the patient and I have to work out what to do next. I don't have loads of scans and bloods and things at my fingertips to get me an answer like that. Quite often what I saw in hospital medicine was that specialists became specialists in investigations. The number of times I saw a cardiologist quickly examine a patient with their stethoscope and then just order an echo, which is an ultrasound of the heart to work out what was going on. They don't really need to think about it. That's their job is to be a specialist, a specialist in investigations. But I really get to be a bit of a Sherlock Holmes in general practice and work out what's going on. And I'm probably the only speaker that's not wearing a stethoscope around my neck. I saw your other speakers wear, and I felt like I should because I'm probably one of the few people that's using that all the time. But actually, because of COVID, we all share stethoscopes, um, one stethoscope in the practice at the moment, and we wipe it down between patients. So I don't even know where it is. Um, the third reason is this, and this is the dashboard of a car. And what I'm trying to say by this picture is that GP, I think, offers the most flexibility of any specialty that you'll ever come across. And I wholeheartedly believe that. Now, I've been doing this job for a few years. And if each of these dials represents a different aspect of your life, so say this is a patient, you know, your, your clinical medicine, so seeing patients, 
this is for me being a mum okay and having days at home with my with oops sorry having days at home with my daughter and this is leadership stuff which I'm really interested in and I run a leadership program now for GPs across the country my point with this picture is that in general practice you can turn up and turn down these dials you know in any combination to any degree that you like at any point in your life when I was 17, 18, I don't think I really appreciated that. Now I've got a daughter, I work three days a week and I'm at home with her two days a week. And loads of qualified GPs are doing the same. And when she's a bit older and she goes to school, I might turn up the medicine bit and do a bit more general practice, do four days or five days. And I'll turn down the, the being a mum bit and she'll be at school. And I can do that across the course of my life in a way that I guarantee you, you'll not find in another specialty. Uh, and I have lots of friends doing other specialties who, so I, I think I can talk from some experience there. And just to give you an idea of what you can do alongside general practice, and I know GPs doing all of these things. So you can be a GP with a special interest and you can even go and work in the hospital if you want to do. If you've got a special interest in, say, gynecology or sexual health or something like that, you, or gastro. I've got friends that do that. They go into the hospital for one afternoon a week and do clinics in the hospital. You can be in education. You can be in research, you can be interested in leadership stuff like I am. You can read the list for yourself in you know, legal work, politics, being a travel doctor. GPs are real generalists. So I have a real interest in homeless health. And you can see the last thing is helping disadvantaged groups. So I've been a volunteer for Crisis, the homeless charity every Christmas for the last five years. And I, I'm one of the most useful doctors there. So I'm working alongside an anaesthetist and an orthopedic surgeon who's like, what do I do with these people? And I know because I'm a generalist. So um, being a GP is really transferable and it's incredible when you realise the amount that you can do alongside being a GP. So I said most people work three or four days in the practice, but they're often doing these other things alongside it. And finally, it's the stories. As I said to you before, I think it's an absolute privilege to wake up every day, as I said at the beginning, and be a part of people's stories. And if you remember nothing else, as I said from my talk, I hope that you remember this. In hospital, diseases stay, patients come and go. In general practice, patients stay and diseases come and go. And I just want to finish really by saying that I love being a GP so much. I think my job is an absolute privilege. And I really hope that whatever you end up doing, you get to say that about your job too. And um, believe in magic because you can all do it. And I'm really happy to take any questions. Okay, awesome. What I'll do for the questions is I'll just share my screen because I've got a um, mentee thing set up for you. Thanks. One moment. So whilst I just do that, if anyone has any questions they can think of. There we go. Cool, thank you. So um, for this, it's the same mentee link, um, but you guys can just go onto that and, and put in your question. Some people also ask some questions via Instagram. So I'll also pass that over to you. So someone asked about um, Imperial. Do you recommend going to Imperial Medicine as opposed to other universities? Obviously you might be biased, but like, the question there is, does it matter which medical school you go to? Yeah, really good question. So the first thing I'd say is it doesn't matter at all which uh, where you go. Nobody, I don't know what um, most of people say, nobody ever asks you really where you went or they don't care. It doesn't count in any application. It really doesn't matter. And I didn't appreciate that so much when I was at your stage. I got a bit stressed about where I wanted to go. So I really, really would make sure that you um, don't worry about that. Think about things like the course structure. Think about where you want to live. Um, I didn't apply to Oxbridge because my parents and my teachers felt for me it was going to be too stressful an environment and probably they were right. I'm quite conscientious. I think I would have got a bit kind of overwhelmed at a place like that. So I loved Imperial. My husband went to Imperial. I recommend it wholeheartedly. Had eight early patient contact, a really good course. I love like it was a fantastic place to live. Being a London medical student was really exciting, great social life. So think about, I wouldn't worry too much about the name or the reputation because nobody cares once you qualify. Just go with kind of your heart, where you want to live, what the course is like, um, more than the name, definitely. And something that's quite interesting actually, 
Um, it's, it's actually very, very um, topical because someone at our medical school, Ivan, who you also know, Ivan, um, he's, he's done some writing about people of um, certain colours not getting represented in medical textbooks. So someone's asked the question, do you ever struggle diagnosing people with colour with certain conditions, especially, for example, skin conditions? Well, I've never been asked that before. Um, I think... Yeah, I guess it can be harder. And I think Ivan's producing really good resources. And I think that's one point to make about general practice that you are always learning. And that's probably something that I need to improve upon. Um, I guess the great thing about GP is when you're not sure about things, you do refer them to the hospital. So yeah. if there's any doubt in your mind about a diagnosis, and what's really good that's come through COVID is we can very easily ask for advice from the hospital. So we literally just drop them a, a, like an email and we say, we can even attach photos to it. And so we've got a patient with this condition. What do you think? And we get advice back within a couple of weeks. So really good question, probably something that I need to get better at doing. So thank you for raising that. Definitely. It's something quite interesting because at medical school, a lot of the textbooks have like skin conditions shown on white skin, but there's a lot of like importance in, 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 in other skins, of course, as well. And sometimes it needs to be changed in, the, in, the, in, in what you learn in medical school and in the actual textbooks. Um, but yeah, so on to the next question. So why did you choose medicine over nursing? Which is a, a classic interview question, but also what's your kind of genuine answer for that? Yeah, really good question. And my aunt, who unfortunately passed away um, when I was 11, but she was a nurse and she was really inspiring to me. And I did shadow some nurses. I would really recommend that you do. I'd also say that I couldn't do my job without the incredible nurses that we have in general practice as well as in the hospital. I think what they do is just phenomenal. For me, I really liked the, the challenge of deciding what happens to a patient in terms of diagnosis and treatment and management plans. Um, that sort of leadership role and the academic challenge that provided so for me that was really appealing and that's why I ended up choosing medicine over nursing but I do think it's an incredibly valuable career and I think you know what nurses do you just can't you can't they're irreplaceable so I wouldn't I haven't done nursing so I wouldn't know whether to recommend it or not but the role that they do is invaluable and someone's asked and this probably links back to that third patient you mentioned with the um uh, the person who wanted to die at home um how do you deal with loss and death that's another excellent question um it's really hard i'm sure even hospital doctors would say it's hard in a way when you are um a GP you do kind of become like a distant friend to your patients you really do and people may say you shouldn't say that but you do they're like they're like you know kind of distant friends and so when they do pass away it's really hard and I, I'm still learning I think over time that I'm hoping that with years of experience I become a bit better at dealing with that I'm quite a sort of empathetic person so I tend to internalize a lot of things and I find that really hard but it's also a real privilege like to be able to spend the final parts of somebody's life, you know, spend your time with somebody who's at the end of their life, making sure that they're where they want to be, which is often at home. They're as comfortable as they want to be. They have everything that they need. And like Enid, who died at home, you know, she I was the last doctor that she was seeing. And so there's a real privilege there, but it is hard and it takes time to process. And I often have to talk to other people in my practice and things to try and kind of come to terms with it. I would also recommend an excellent book, um, two excellent books about end of life, which are also good to kind of mention in personal statements and interviews. So one is by Atul Gawande called Being Mortal. Mm -hmm. And the other one is called With the End in Mind by someone called, I think it's Catherine Mannix. It's a slightly more recent book, With the End in Mind. And both of those books are beautiful books about end of life care, which have really helped me to kind of process that. But excellent question, thank you. Brilliant. And um, this question on screen. So how do you overcome imposter syndrome? So what imposter syndrome means is the feeling of not being able to do something. So I think this links back to your magic trick at the start where when you're a student or when you're an aspiring medical student, you, you, you think a lot of what a doctor does is magic and you, you don't really understand how they do it. And when you're kind of in that situation, I often find in a hospital myself, even though I'm a sixth year medical student, I kind of feel out of place, doubt whether I am I'm even good enough to be there or I know enough to be there. 
So how did you overcome that when you first started? And do you still feel imposter syndrome at any stage? Yeah, I feel it all the time. And the thing I'd say is I've come to understand that that never really goes away. I don't think, you know, when you rotate from primary school to secondary school, you feel like an imposter. When you do your GCSE, you feel like an imposter. When you do your A-levels, you feel like an imposter. When you get to medical school, you feel like an imposter. When you get a foundation, you know, every stage, when you rotate from F1 to F2, from F2 to GP, ST1, I think you feel like an imposter every single stage and it never goes away. And the thing is, if you talk to senior GPs, they tell you that that feeling of being a bit out of your depth is always there. So for me, recognising that other people feel that all the time has been really helpful if you think about it it's not necessarily something you want to completely overcome because having a bit of it is quite healthy it reminds you that you're not you know you don't know everything and you need to keep learning and you need to ask for help so I'd say if somebody told me they didn't ever get the imposter syndrome I'd be quite worried but the other thing on a practical note that really helps me so I talk to people I talk to other GP trainees and we've got a great GP trainee kind of community when you're in general practice and sharing those things with other people knowing that other people are going through the same can really help and getting their advice talking to trusted friends and family members so my husband's always reminding me he's like you know you feel a bit out of your depth but actually you felt out of your depth when you were uh, an f1 and you managed to deal with that really well and he reminds me looking back at past experience that i've managed it before so i can manage it again and recognizing that it's hard you know i see 30 40 patients every day that's a lot to process i'm not going to know all the answers i'm likely to feel like an imposter that's totally normal and again if you want a really good book on this um i read a great book on the imposter syndrome called the secret thoughts of successful women which isn't very it's by valerie someone i'm probably one of your amazing people and i will put it in the chat <laughs> Um, the secret thoughts of successful women it's not just for women it's for men as well completely and it's not a very well titled book but it's all about um you know why people struggle with this even when they're really successful and some really good strategies to overcome it okay brilliant um on to the next question and this links to a very common topic in the news and in in, in the world in general about mental health because i know that there's an increasing number of consultations and people who rely on their GPs for mental health. So how do you cope with the short consultation times, especially if someone comes to you feeling quite down, wanting someone to talk to, you can't just bring them in and rush them out within 10 minutes. How do you cope with that? Yeah, great question. And thank you for whoever asked that. I think I would say that it's hard. It's absolutely hard. You cannot do mental health in 10 minutes. You cannot. I just don't believe that you can and do it well. Or you certainly can't do it well in 10 minutes. So what's quite good about the pandemic is now that we're doing lots of phone things, I have some phone calls that are five minutes that are really quick. So a patient just needs a prescription or a referral letter. And that means I've got enough time. So mental health, I will almost always do 15, 20, 30 minutes, whatever it takes. I just don't think you should rush those things. The good thing is because of the way things have become more efficient with phone calls, I have I usually have that time. And the other thing is, remember, you don't have to do it all in one go. So you can bring people back. So sometimes I'll say, you know, we've talked for about 20 minutes today. Let us let me call you again in two days time. I, you know, it's, I don't have to wait a week. I'm back in in two days time. Let's have another call and we'll, we'll talk again. And I can do that week in, week out. So the continuity that you have in general practice is really good for that. But it is hard and I don't do it in, in five or 10 minutes. OK, and, and someone asked, what's your favorite kind of patient and along uh, uh, um, alongside that I'll ask what's your least favorite kind of patient because you must see a lot of variety you might see young people you might see babies but also you might see that 85 year old person as well I'd say my favourite kind of patient for me is I really, so in Cambridge, I deal with a lot of students. Mm. I quite like the sort of young, not like, but the thing I probably where I feel most comfortable with are young students with mental health problems that are not so severe that they're kind of psychotic and need specialist input because that wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to do that very well. But eating disorders, anorexia, um, de anxiety, depression, I think you can really, you can do a lot of good for those people in general practice. They often just need a listening ear. You know, you can relate to them as a young woman, I can relate to them. And so I feel like I can probably have the most impact with those people. And the place where I, I wouldn't say dislike, but where I feel most out of my depth is probably, oh, this is a good question. I'd say I'm not so good with like uh, musculoskeletal things. 
So when someone's got a joint problem or a knee problem, it's always the same sort of advice. It's like rest, ice it, elevate it. But I don't really, I'm not that good at knowing exactly what's going on without any kind of investigations to hand. So I probably find that hardest. But again, we've got physiotherapists now in our practice and we've also got a GP who's a specialist in, in musculoskeletal. So I've got good people I can ask. I don't think I'm as good at that. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, and it's something that, as you mentioned before, when you're a GP, you need to know every chapter of an Oxford handbook. But there'll be some which you obviously like more than others. So like that's obviously natural. There are bits that you like more. Um, and last couple of questions. So someone's asked about health inequalities. Um, have you seen this in your career? And perhaps when you worked at different practices, did it vary? Yeah, really good question. So Cambridge is quite a wealthy area, but it ha it's actually the most unequal city in the whole of the UK because we have such wealth on one side and such poverty on the other side. And I've done quite a lot of volunteering in that with the homeless population, like I mentioned. So I have seen it and I've done a bit of work at the homeless practice that we have in Cambridge. So it's, it's really, really hard. I probably couldn't tell you kind of exactly all the factors that are leading to the to the inequalities. For me, I think one of the biggest things is just childhood experience and we need to invest in the early years. Um, but definitely health inequality is a huge factor in, in Cambridge. Um, mm -hmm. And I think as a GP, I really hope one day to be able to have an impact on that. That's the other good thing about general practice is you're embedded in the community. So I know probably that in my career, if I wanted to, and I hope to, I will be able to help with that in a way that um, I don't think hospital doctors quite have that opportunity. So I'm really hoping to be able to help with that. Brilliant. And one final question. So thank you so much for your time, Nishma. This person has heard you speak at Imperial before, which is really good to hear. Um, and and they, they, they still know their stories. But they're just asking, do you feel as though GPs are labelled as the underdogs of the medical scene compared to hospital doctors? And that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it depends who you talk to. So I tend to surround myself with sort of like-minded people who are quite enthusiastic about general practice. I think historically, yes, general practice has been sort of seen as the poor sister of secondary care. But I think that's absolutely crazy if you think about it. And I certainly don't believe it. And I wouldn't let that sort of negativity and that reputation influence your choice. Unfortunately, I think that person who asked the question is, is right. It's still there. And um, we're trying to do as much as we can to change that narrative. But it's been around for a long time. And it's absolutely bonkers because if you think about it, as I said, 90 percent of patient contact yeah in general practice the impact that we have in general practice is enormous someone once told me that general practice is like the heat sink of the computer so apparently in the motherboard of your computer there's a bit that like you don't really see you don't hear it at all but if you opened it up it's there and it's absorbing risk or it's sorry it's absorbing heat from your computer all the time so if you took it away your computer would completely crash yeah. and general practice is a bit like the risk sink of the nhs so it's there silently in the background absorbing risk every single day keeping people away from secondary care keeping them well at home and if we took it away the entire nhs would collapse but i don't know that people always appreciate that 100 percent Okay, yeah, so thank you so much for coming along, Nishma. That's been a, a really, really inspiring close to the uh, Worth Experience event. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add or should I hand over back to Shivam and Mo who will just to close the session with me? No, thank you very much for having me. Very best of luck to you all for whatever you decide to do. Okay, awesome, thanks a lot, Nishma. Really appreciate that. Um, okay, great, guys. So we're entering the final 10 minutes now of the day, final five to 10 minutes, really. Um, so we have Shivam and Mohal back with us. They're still sticking around. And well done to all 700 of you who've stuck around for the whole day because there's barely been any people leaving, which is really good. Um, and you guys have done a really good job. And we're going to close off and, and finish off in the next five to 10 minutes. So just one last shout for anyone who couldn't join the WhatsApp group before. If you scan this QR code, then you can join the group. And we have a webinar every single week from Shiv yeah. and um, Ellie, as well as other members of our team, covering things like UCAT, BMAP, personal statement, work experience, motivation for medicine, et cetera. So if you join these WhatsApp groups, you'll get first access to these really good webinars. 
Can I, is this only open to year 12s or for example what about year 11 students or graduates is it open to everyone it's open to everyone really because we have lots of different webinars going on so if you're in year 13 you might care more about ones on a levels for example whereas if you're in year 11 things like work experience why medicine is more important year 12 might be more focused on the ucat and bmat so mm. there's so much going on and we also decide the webinar topics based on feedback from you guys so if you want a particular topic, let's say like um, COVID-19 and the impact on medicine, we can do that. We're, we're, we're very flexible. Okay, so I'll go on to the next one. So if you guys don't mind um, writing some honest feedback for us, we'd really, really appreciate it. Um, we're not asking it for it to be good or bad. We just want something honest from you guys about how you found the day our whole team has put lots of work into making a really good structured day for you. So if you don't mind just scanning this QR code, um, which looks very odd, um, Moho <laughs> will also send a, a link for a Trustpilot. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just put it in the, um, in the group chat. And then that will take us a couple of minutes. So we'll just give you guys a couple of minutes to do that. And once that's done, we'll then go on to the final, final stage where you guys can submit your names, your emails, and we can get those. Uh, yeah, um, so I think quite a few people on Instagram, et cetera, asking about certificates. So just once we've done all these bits, we'll, we'll tell you how to get the certificates at the end. And once you've left the review, if you just put a heart um, on the menti, so we know that you've, you've done it. So if you just, just fill that in, uh, and we'll give you some time. And as Kanal said, you know, we, we want to keep running these. We'll do a, a second day as well if we felt you, know, you, you guys found it useful, beneficial, et cetera. So do let us know um, if there are particular things you liked, certain speakers, um, you can mention that as well. Um, and whilst people are filling out the reviews, um, now do you just want to talk about, for example, if, if for year 12 students in particular, what, what should they be doing at this stage of the application? Yeah, so right now I would say it's important to think about whether you want to apply for medicine because it can be quite difficult. I was quite unsure at this stage in year 12. Um, so thinking about whether you want to do medicine and hence coming to these work experience events is really useful. Also thinking ahead to the UCAT and the BMAT, which are two important tests you might take in summer holidays, um, especially UCAT, which is what the majority of you guys will be doing. Um, don't stress too much about it. Um, you don't need to start straight away, but lots of students do start working slowly towards the UCAT. And I would say that there are lots of questions. You could just start doing maybe one or two yeah. hours per week, familiarizing yourself with the different sections of the UCAT and also the BMAT as well, if you are doing the BMAT and then working towards the summer holidays, because in the summer, you'll need to do your UCAT and your personal statement. And if you're applying to BMAT universities, you'll also need to do the BMAT either in September or slightly later on in the year. So, so just getting used to that timetable would be quite useful. Um, I know it's quite stressful for you guys because you're going back to school and um, lockdowns ending, etc. So don't stress out too much, but start thinking ahead. Um, Shivan, what would you say in terms of how to look towards the UCAT and how to structure your preparation for it? I think you've kind of gone through the main kind of themes here in terms of um, thinking about whether medicine is for you. You know, um, at the end of the day, it's just about collecting different experiences and, and just seeing whether you have the skill set to actually go into medicine, whether you actually think it will be a career for you. Um, also, one thing we haven't really talked about too much today is actually how broad medicine is well you know we, we've talked a bit about the kind of gp aspect but there's so much more to medicine and obviously we couldn't kind of fit it in because we'd be going on to midnight but i mean the it really is about if you want if you be a doctor if you become a doctor there's so much more more to being a doctor really you know you help fit different patients um in in, in the community setting in the hospital it can be worldwide um, so just have a think about that as well. But in terms of UCAT preparation, I would highly recommend just having a feel and understanding of what the UCAT is about. Um, and again, we, well, I've been getting loads and loads of messages on Instagram and on kind of the Instagram page to say thank you. And we really do appreciate that. Um, if you can fill out that trust pilot form, it would be really, really useful because we want to have another session like this. And, and we really appreciate all the people that have stuck around. And we, we do hope that, that you've had a good time as well. And it's useful when you guys write the feedback, mention which sessions you, you liked as mobile. Yeah. So whether you liked mobile session, Shivam session, um, uh, Mishma session, Ellie session, 
So to just mention that and mention the bits that you find useful, because if, you, if for example, you guys like the handover interactive exercise Moho did, next time we'll do lots more of that. If you like, like Nishma's um, inspirational talk about different patient types, we can do more of that as well. Um, and with work experience, like I always ask students, why do you do it? And there's two real reasons or, or two key reasons. One is for yourself. Do you actually want to do medicine? Work experience helps you see that and helps you actually choose whether medicine is right for you. And secondly, because it's also useful for your application. So for things like your interviews, for things like your personal statement, you need to talk about your work experience to kind of provide evidence for why you want to do medicine. Show that you haven't just chosen medicine because your family told you to or because you think it sounds cool. You, you kind of need to justify why you want to do medicine. But the first reason is always the most, most important. Do it for yourself and, and for what you'll gain out of it. And second, for the quality of the application. And same for things like DOV. People always talk about do DOV for your UCAS application. But no, do it for yourself. Do it if you want to go for walks with your friends and, and do expeditions. And then secondary, you might consider the extra benefits. So we'll just give it another minute or so. If we can get the hearts up to 200, that'd be awesome. Um, once you've written a testimonial, just put a heart in. Um, Mohul, what would you say for students who are kind of seeing doctors working in, in the middle of a pandemic and some people are quite scared of it, some people are quite inspired by it? What would you say about that? Because there has been an increase in medical applicants by nearly 20% in the last year. So obviously people are yeah. regarding doctors maybe as more heroic, but what would you say about that? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think if you, for example, on the edge or on the fence, should I do medicine or not? I think the pandemic, it may, for example, push anything. I, I, I want to be, you know, those people that people are clapping for. But remember, this this pandemic was a, very, a once in a lifetime event. We're hopefully not going to see another pandemic again. Um, and when you think about whether you want to be a doctor, it's not just about that one year or a few months. It's going to be something you'll be, be doing for 40, 50 years. So I think it's difficult this year because you aren't able to do work experience, but we'll hopefully do more of these events. Um, and I'd say get more of an understanding about whether it, it, it is 100% that you want to do medicine because it's quite a long journey. And if you're on the fence and you're unsure, um, it's probably not the best career for you. But also, you know, if you don't decide now, nowadays, there's lots of new medical schools, there's lots of opportunities to become a doctor in non-traditional ways. For example, rather than just doing A-levels, etc., there's talk about apprenticeships. Um, there's people who, for example, do other degrees and then come into medicine there. So there's a wealth of opportunities. Um, so I think with, with the pandemic, um, yeah, just, just try and, I'd say, use it. Um, but also remember that this pandemic will not be around forever. Um, and you have to want to do medicine for other reasons as well. well. Brilliant. So I think we've given you guys enough time. So let's go on to the next slide. So thank you so, so much to anyone who's written any feedback. We, we really do appreciate it. Um, so again, any more webinars, we'll leave this on for 20 seconds. Just if anyone wants to um, find out about any more webinars, the link is there. We also have a parents evening coming up. If there's any parents here or you want to pass it on to your parents, this is just like a guidance on uh, the timeline of the application, et cetera, and from a parent's point of view. And hopefully we can get a couple of parents to come in and talk to give their experiences of how they dealt with all the stresses of, 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 of their child applying for medicine. Yeah, and with this, for each event, you have to register because otherwise you won't get the link. Um, and when you put the email address in, please put the your email, because if you put making a typo, um, you won't get the link. So if you fill that, that in and you haven't got an email straight after filling it, just double check because you may have entered the wrong email. It may have gone to your junk. So I think for today, for example, a lot of people didn't get the link. So I think just, just check your email straight away because otherwise you may miss out on, on the opportunity. And, you know, Shivam, Shivam and Ellie are going to be doing these for the next few weeks. Lots of tips on UCAT, et cetera. Um, so definitely check those out. Okay, so we're entering the final couple of minutes, but just to give you some insight into Medic Mind, um, we've helped thousands of students over the past few years. We have loads of free materials, things like our YouTube channel, our UCAS guide, lots of blogs, lots of question banks, and also some courses as well. Uh, like we have like a UCAT course, we have UCAT tutoring, etc. 
what I'd say is that it, it is quite overwhelming the number of materials and different question banks and things yeah. that are out there. But just try to stay calm and tackle the admission steps, uh, admission tests step by step, um, and don't become too overwhelmed. But if you ever have any questions, you can always drop us a message. We worked with quite a few medical schools this year, such as Bristol, such as King's, for example, to run UCAT courses. And hopefully even our free videos on YouTube can help you out as well. Yeah, and, and just coming on to that, we're actually looking to come to some schools and do some free talks as well. So on the on the form, if you're able to mention any sc- the school that you go to, you know, we can consider doing that as well. Yeah, because we're more than happy to come to a school, do a free talk, even if there's no course or anything, that doesn't matter. We'd be happy just to do yeah. like, a talk to students like this, but in like a smaller, smaller group. Okay. Awesome. So, um, okay, last thing before we do the final bit. Um, if you want to use this voucher, you can just take the code WEX10 to get £10 of any of our tutoring or our courses. What the tutoring involves is like a one-to-one lesson. So let's say for, let's say for UCAT, you wanted to have a lesson with someone like um, Shivan, for example, who's one of the UCAT tutors. You can get ten pounds off with this code. And we have lots of free materials. So, like we have uh, UCAT practice questions on our website and our YouTube channel as well. So, this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube, and we'll also have future videos on there as well. So, other members of our team, such as, for example, Daniel and George, who are two of our really important tutors, they've put some free UCAT tutorials on there for you. So, and yeah. you'll find Shivam there as well. Um, he's Shivan basically done a that. whole interview course. <laughs> <laughs> Shivam will always be around if you if you check anything on Medic Mind. Um, he, you can always find him. So yeah. And same for BMAT. So if, if you guys are seeing BMAT, I'm sure around 20% of you, 30% of you will be doing BMAT. Um, one thing we launched last week is free solutions to the BMAT past papers. So there's lots of BMAT past papers on the official website. But what's annoying is that there's no past paper solutions for the BMAT. Um, So some companies have like uh, books and stuff that they sell. But we've just launched a page where you can get access to work solutions for everything for free. So it's quite useful if you do a BMAT past paper to, to use that. Awesome. Okay, great. So Finally uh, sorry, for, sorry for all the links and stuff. Like we're just trying to give you some useful materials, like free UCAT questions and BMAT questions. Um, and now we're nearly at the end. Well, we're pretty much at the end. So if you guys could just fill out this form where you can mention your name and your email address. And what we'll do is within 24 hours or so, you'll get emailed a personal certificate of coming to this work experience event. And this is just for your proof of attendance. You don't have to mention that you came to this anywhere, but if you want to use it in your work, in your um, interview or in your personal statement, you're completely free to. Um, But again, as I mentioned before, that's not the reason you come to these work experience things. You come to learn. And then if you want to mention it later on, you can. Definitely. And and I'd I'd recommend watching this session back on YouTube because you know, Shivan, for example, you you were talking about lots of different terms in your one. I used a lot of, of terms. So, when I mentioned something, for example, like um, phagocytosis or um, ECG, et cetera, just pause there, Google it, find out more about that. Because, for example, if you, you could end up doing an EPQ or like a small research project on that. Um, and I think from today, the main idea was just to give you a feel of what it's like to be a doctor, like a medical student, et cetera. It's not to put you off or um, anything like that. So that's the main thing. And the certificate, you know, it will be there for you but that's not why you guys have come here today um and hopefully you know you've got you've gained a lot as as Kanal said um Shivan do you have anything else to add before you know we finish up yeah I think the main thing from today really is just um that big word that we mentioned again and again and again which is reflection so today is all about really reflecting on um re- kind of the new things that we've taught all of you guys whether that be about anatomy whether that be about the life of a GP Um, I think just make sure that you go back to almost the beginning and just think about what did we discuss right at the start? Um, Because, you know, it's all good and well, you know, thinking about becoming a consultant, becoming a GP, but actually in two years time, you could potentially be a a medical student and actually going to to university and being a medical student. And that, to be honest, is, 
your main priority. Don't think about things that are coming, you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the line, because that will just, you know, things change. Things change over time. Maybe the GP training scheme changes. Maybe becoming a consultant will change. But actually, becoming a medical student won't really change in that sense. So um, I think a, a lot to really take away. I'm, I'm so glad that so many people found it, found it useful. But I think the main thing from today is, is definitely fight, think about reflection, think about these kind of terms that we've been using today. But um, it, again, the whole point of today was just to kind of enjoy it as well and just have, it, have a bit of an understanding of what it's like being a medical student, being a doctor as well. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, I think we'll, f- we'll finish there. Um... Yeah, so if everyone filled out the form. That's so what fine. you can do is if, if you haven't filled it out or, or want to fill out later, just take a picture on your, on your camera. Um, just just for, for future reference and you have to have attended this um, webinar to get the certificate so um, you know for example if, if you're looking to share it with your friends etc they won't get a certificate so you have to have attended the, the webinar to get this certificate. One thing is that if if anyone has attended but didn't fill in the registration I, I like first of all I'm not sure how you would have got in but if, if you did do that if you fill in the registration retrospectively and at least we can match up your attendance form to your registration but yeah exactly um, and if you just fit, fill it in before 7 p.m today um, because that will be your cutoff so if you fill it in before if you fill it in after 7 p.m unfortunately we won't be able to give you a um, certificate um so yeah please do fill it in before 7 p.m um so yeah perfect yeah so thank you so much guys for coming along it's actually amazing that we, we only have 15 people less than when we started so it shows that yeah above 700 of you guys have stuck around for a few hours and learned so much, uh, which is really, really good to see. Um, and it's a really good way to spend your Saturday afternoon. So have a really good evening, take a rest. And thank you so much to Moho and Shivan who spent a lot of time talking about their stages of their medical career, as well as Ellie and Nishma earlier as well. Um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll end this call now and hopefully we'll see you next week at the next webinar that we're running um, and we'll see you in future weeks. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.